the Silvestri one? Nathan versus Silvestri? Was it Nate already? C6, just, you know. What can he make?
Welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. Day two of the Millionaire Chess Open starts right now. The ancient sport of chess is about to change forever. Welcome to the highest stakes chess tournament in history. Featuring the game's most talented grandmasters and a large pool of players from around the world, all playing for a million dollar purse. Welcome to the first ever Millionaire Chess Open from the main ballroom of Planet Hollywood on the Las Vegas Strip. Chess will never be the same. Welcome everybody to round three of the Millionaire Chess Open here live from the ballroom of Planet Hollywood, Las Vegas. We have over 550 players from 40 different countries playing for a million dollar total prize purse. My name is Ariane Kowili and I am here with Grandmaster Robert Hess. Robert, what are your impressions of the last round last night? We are round three now, but the action is just heating up. What are your impressions of yesterday? Yeah, yesterday was a crazy day. We saw a huge upset in the first round with Justice Williams, topped in the second round by Laquang Liam's upset defeat against Wang Yuan from China. Uh, players were tired by the evening. They didn't uh, have their full composure. It was very clear that they weren't at their best chess at the stroke of midnight. But here in round three, a well-rested group, I think we'll see some exciting battles today. I think so too, Robert. Yesterday proved to have quite a few upsets, totally unexpected from uh, the top seeds. Let's have a look at the standings after round two. We have 21 people tied for first place with the, some of the obvious favorites up there, Bu Shang Zi, Sam Shanklin, Alejandro Ramirez, Wesley So. Lawrence, what's your take on these standings? What's going to happen today? Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's still very early on in the tournament. Obviously, round three, long way to go before Millionaire Monday and the knockouts and so on. But it's clear that with the upsets we saw yesterday, this tournament is to get there, you're going to have to play the best chess of your life. For me, today, we've got at least nine pairings, grandmaster pairings. They're, they're all in progress at the moment. We're going to have a look in a mo well, shortly at what I feel are the, the rounds or the games of, of this round. If we see here on board one, Wesley So, the top seed, he, he did really well to win that game against Ivanov and I think he used the fact that it was late at night, he ground Ivanov down. He's playing against the young American, originally from Costa Rica, Alejandro Ramirez. We can see there on the stat board that when it comes to threatening positions when Wesley So's pieces are mobile, he does extremely well. Whereas when Alexandro Ramirez is playing, he's very good when he's got space and pass pawn. So clash of styles there, we'll see how that goes. Another key matchup, we've got the strongest man in chess. And I mean that from a purely physical perspective, the guy's an absolute beast, gyms it up five times, can probably lift at least 120 kilos. Kaido Kulauts, is he as good at the gym as he is on the board? Very much so, he's rated 26.57. Great when it comes to his pieces working together, active positions. He's playing against the shank master, Sam Shankland, who recently tore up uh, the Olympiad in Norway. He's great when it comes to threatening positions and so on. So it's going to be a great clash of styles there. And another really interesting matchup we've got here, Ruben Felgai, the Argentinian Grandmaster. He's playing against Zanji Bu, who again managed to win a totally drawn position. Unfortunately, yesterday his opponent Chandra bungled it, moved his pawn to F6, shouldn't have done that. So Zanji Bu should have drawn two, has won two. Maybe this is his tournament. We'll be looking out for those games. Wow, we have some real matchups today to look at. But before we get into the games, let's have a look at what Alexander, our MC correspondent, has to say. Thanks, guys. Another exciting day, day two. I wanted to start the show today on my segment to tell you about the Millionaire Chess app that you can get for Android, Blackberry, or your iPhone. If you can see, it's really easy. You just have to put in a username. It doesn't have to be your real name. And it feeds you all the up-to-date information. As well, you can watch the show live and watch uh, Ariane, Robert, and um, Lawrence tell you all the stats as we go along. 
and the polls, the puzzles of the day, and everything you need to know with Millionaire Chess. Now, this is an innovation that Amy Lee created, so she definitely has a feature, a future in app creations. It's very user-friendly. It's an amazing app, and if you need to know anything about Millionaire Chess, I encourage you to download it and have a look, and you can follow us live throughout the tournament as we head towards Millionaire Monday. Back to you guys. Thanks, Alexander. This is going to be an exciting day. Before we get right into the action of Game 1, Wesley So versus Alejandro Ramirez, I want to remind everybody to get into the Twittersphere, hashtag Millionaire Chess. Don't forget, anything you have to say, we might flash your tweets up there if it's interesting and funny enough. So go ahead there on Twitter, hashtag Millionaire Chess. Robert, what's going on on game number one? Well, Wesley So continues to dominate. He still maintained his board one position. He played excellent chess yesterday, a late night battle against Alexander Ivanov. And today he's playing the young Costa Rican, now in, living in America and playing for America, Alejandro Ramirez. But his position on the board isn't too great right now. That's not to say it's bad, but he's facing uh, an active position by Ramirez. Ramirez just moved his bishop out to g4, which immediately puts pressure on this bishop on e2. His pawn on d5 is slightly weak because no other pawns can connect to it, but at the same time, white's king is not castled. If white does go for the castle right now, he has to watch out for this bishop on e5, which may, later in the game, put pressure on this h2 pawn and launch an attack. But in the meantime, a simple move like rook to c8 puts pressure on this white queen, and white doesn't look like he has much of an advantage in the early going. Robert, what would you say if we exchange a few pieces here, wouldn't black's position be gradually worse? If, if Isn't Wesley's goal here to exchange as many minor pieces as he can to take advantage of that isolated d5 pawn? Yeah, that's definitely the point, Ariane. And if we go back to the game position as it is right here, the idea is to put pressure with this rook on d1 and attack this d5 pawn. However, as we mentioned, white is uncastled, and the king cannot remain in the center forever. So the pawn is very well defended by the knight on f6 and the queen on d8, and there's just not enough time. If we go rook to d1, again, this move rook to c8 comes with a tempo, hitting the queen, and I think Alejandro has to be very content with the position on the board. Yeah, and we got to remember that Alejandro is a real fighter. In, in the last World Cup, he gave a huge fight to Grandmaster Tomaszewski, who was a finalist there at the World Cup in Tromso. And he mentioned in an interview that Alejandro was, was his hardest match by far. So when it comes to nerves, Alejandro's got it. He, he, he's going to fight this one out, I think. Yeah, definitely. And I've played Alejandro a bunch of times in the U.S. Chess Championship and other places. He's a great fighter. And just because Wesley So is the higher rated, and we saw the statistics show that the higher rated player between these two types of players favors Wesley dramatically, it's not the same story on the board right now. Alejandro fighting very well. Thank you, Robert. Let's go to maybe to board two. We have one of the youngest grandmasters in chess history, Bu Shangji, who is now in his late 20s, but still extremely strong and number two seed here at the Millionaire Chess Open. How is he going? Yeah, once again, Bu Shangji has not gotten much out of the opening. Uh, he is black against a very strong Argentine grandmaster, Ruben Felgeier, and the position may be settling down into a draw. So black has just exchanged rooks on e5, Felgeier will probably return with the bishop on e5, and as we see from the position, both sides have queen, rook, and bishop, and six pawns apiece, which lends me to believe that this game will be a draw. Uh, Bu Zhangji has been the miracle worker of the tournament. Both games, he hasn't gotten much, but a surprise opponent managed to win. And I think long term, white has the plan to move this pawn to d5 and create a pass pawn. So I think that white stands better because of the activity, the mobility of the pieces, and the backwardness of black's material. Yeah, and you know, I think that Ruben Felgar from Argentina, he's one of these players who is constantly underrated. Coming from Argentina, you know, they're the economic situation is very difficult to, to play tournaments and become a grandmaster quickly and get your rating up. And he's always kind of had to live in that environment, so he's always underrated. I think he's going to be a bit of a dark horse in this tournament. Extremely unpredictable, very talented, and perhaps he's going to give the, the very top guys a run for their money. Definitely. He's always been a competitor and he will be in this tournament as well. So Lawrence, what do you think about this? Well, this game here that we've got on board to, Felgeier versus Bujanji, don't, uh, don't get the fireworks out, ladies and gentlemen. Save them for another occasion, because it's not the most exciting game we'll ever see. But one thing's for sure, Bu, in my opinion, if I'd take anybody, it's actually black. And let me explain why. He's just played the move Queenie 6, which is a very good move. 
It means that he's now attacking this pawn on c4 and depriving white of playing this move that Robert and Ariane said that he would love to play. If white could get in d4 to d5 and create this pass pawn in the middle, that would be very strong. However, with this move, it means that he's attacking this c4 pawn. White will inevitably have to defend, let's say, with a move like queen c3, once more threatening d5. But now just the move rook d8. And you know what? If black manages to get control of the d5 square via a move like b5, maybe it's actually white's pawn on d4 that could end up weak. So I still would back a draw in this position because I think Ruben's easily strong enough to get there, but Boo, certainly no trouble whatsoever. And let's go to another prodigy from China, Yu Yangyi, one of the heroes of the Chinese gold medalist team at the Trumps Olympiad this year. How is he going? Yeah, I wouldn't even call him one of the heroes. I call him the hero of the Chinese Olympiad team. He won a gold medal there. He, the team won a gold medal, and he won individual gold medals. So he is probably a national hero at the moment. His game right now is fairly complex. He has sacrificed the pawn on a7, but at the same time, that white knight is very greatly misplaced. We don't like our knights all the way on the side of the board, far from the action at hand. So right now, the natural-looking move, knight to b5, to save that piece, might run into some tactics with pawn takes e3. And now the bishop on d3 is under attack. Black's pieces have in incredible mobility. The bishop on d3 is mentioned as weak. The pawn on f2 might be coming next. It looks like black has a great position in the early going in this game. Yu Yangli, Yang Yi is playing great chess. Do you think he would have prepared this opening? Do you think he's still in his preparation? You know, you never know. Sometimes people prepare out 30 moves of opening theory. They really work hard at home. But there's so many surprises in chess. That's how many variations there are. You'll never know. I think he's comfortable. I don't know if he's in his preparation, but he should be happy about his position right now. Right, let's have a look at some variations. What, it's White's move at the moment. He has to protect the bishop on d3, is that right? Yeah, the bishop on d3 is under attack, and a natural looking move like rook a to d1 would be possible. A potential issue is his pawn on a2. For the moment, it's untouchable because white has a killer threat with bishop to h7 check. The idea, the rook on d1 now directly hits that black queen. So there are discovery threats. However, if black moves away from that with a move like maybe king to h8, a very subtle move, there is potential for black to continue the attack. And perhaps even better than the move king h8 is simply knight takes d3. And the idea, now I've gotten rid of that discovery attack, this knight on b5 is still very much misplaced. The pawn on a2 is weak, and black will have the two bishops advantage going forward. Yeah, I think that this position for black with the two bishops is going to prove pretty difficult for the young Conrad Holt to defend. Lawrence, I believe you have a thought on this. Yeah, absolutely. These are the sorts of positions where the chess engine really thrives. Sometimes, still nowadays, we have a computer that will say something, but it still doesn't quite grasp the fundamentals. But in these kind of positions, where there are pieces flying all over the place, lots of tactics at hand, it does really well. In fact, Conrad Holt is, in practical terms, big, big trouble. As Robert rightly said, the knight on a7 is not doing much, but more importantly, this pawn takes e3 discovered attack on the bishop is a problem. Now, Conrad does have a way to get out of this, but he has to calculate very well. After the knight comes back to b5, black will take this pawn. And then in this position, the only move to keep the balance is actually to play the move bishop to c4. Not such a difficult move to find, but with so many different kinds of variations he has to analyze, one that we can't be certain about. The point of bishop c4 is that now, if the rook were to come back to c8 looking to pin things down here, white's best try is actually jump back to a7, hitting the rook, and just keep on hitting the rook. White can't do anything else. If he allows the rook to stay there on c8, he's simply going to get in a world of trouble down this c-line. This rook bearing down there is too difficult, especially with this pawn lurking on e3. So actually here, what the machine is saying is this should be a draw after a repetition. Knight a7, rook a8, knight b5, rook c8, and we'll shake hands in a three-move repetition. But Comrade, he's focused. Question is, is he going to find that any other move apart from this? And he's in really bad shape. You know, this kind of position is extremely sharp. It requires excellent calculation. And I think in terms of calculation and opening preparation, Yu Yang Yi here is in the driving seat. But hopefully, young Conrad can start calculating a few moves himself. 
I would like to remind everybody that these guys are playing for a lot of money. Uh, just a little bit. Just a little <laughs> bit. Million dollar prize purse, the biggest prize purse in open tournament history. Let's have a look at the open section. The champion walks away with $100,000. Second place, $50,000. Third place, $25,000. And everything under that doesn't seem too insignificant. The open section has a total payout of $409,000. But let's not forget, we also have amateur sections, which come with a lot of money themselves. Let's have a look at that. Amateur section, so we have four starting at under 2,200. First place walks away with $40,000. Robert, I don't think you can go anywhere in the world in an open tournament, in other words, not an invitational tournament, and be under 2,200 and have the chance to walk away with $40,000. I think that's, that's the first time in history. It's unheard of and it's really a great precedent to set because the amateurs really make up a large proportion of chess. There are not that many chess professionals. And to incentivize them with such a huge prize fund, it's a really great thing. And look at this, we have under 1,400. This is unprecedented in history. First place walking away with $24,000 for an under 1,400 player. I think that is incredible. Definitely, and a lot of these will be young children competing for the prize. Young children and seven years old to 70 years old. We have everybody here. Lawrence? Back in about 1999, I came to Philadelphia. I was a young whippersnapper, had fluffy mustaches, going through puberty, that kind of thing. And I played in the World Open, and I think I won $1,000, and I was 13. And do you know what? I know things have changed, and people have iPads, and Beats, Dre, all of that kind of thing. A lot of technology, a bit different 15 years ago, 16 years ago. But I'll tell you what, $1,000 back then was a lot of money. Ariane, Robert, what is a 13-year-old kid going to do with $24,000? <laughs> I mean, really? There's well, only we had so many iPads and Playstations that you can buy. We had one kid yesterday who said... What are they going to do with the money? Lawrence, we had one kid yesterday who said he's going to donate his to environmental NGOs or charities. That, that's one smart kid there. Yeah, th these kids are bright. I wouldn't do that. If <laughs> Why I doesn't he donate it to us? <laughs> Maybe if set I up a, a college dollars. fund. Who knows? You know, there's so much to do with that kind of money, but you know, to get there is the hard part. To, to dream about it is easy. And I admire these parents who come all the way from LA, New York, all around America with their families. We saw a few yesterday, and they're here supporting their kids, playing in all of these sections. I think it's remarkable. Chess is so good for families, bringing them together, bringing people together. And as we can see, look at that, representative from over 40 countries. This is really bringing people together for a smart game. Yeah, definitely. And it shows just in the, the visual there, so many players competing here. And, you know, we talk about families. We had a couple guests on the show yesterday, including the wonderful six-year-old with the great bow tie. We see chess can bring out the best of people. Hat, that kid was smiling. He won his game. So hopefully this trend continues and these players will enjoy the rest of this event. Yes, Robert, speaking of very smart, talented, charming young men, let's have a look at a small profile of Shafin Ibrahim. Well, what got me interested in taking part in this was that I saw that this GM, Maurice Ashley, was so enthusiastic and he spent so much time on this, so I thought it was going to be a really good experience and a lot of ex exposure to a lot of different players from different countries, because I mostly play with my players from my local area. So. For the past couple of weeks, I've had training with my coaches, and also when I'm home, I spend like three to four hours straight just studying my tactics and books and everything. I have to always think about how I'm going to do what, all the tips I have to keep in mind when I'm playing and you know, to make sure I have everything on point so I don't make any mistake because I really want to win this tournament. Yes, I would like to win the money so I can like, help, the chair, help the poor, start my own nonprofit organization. I've been working on that for a while. My parents' support and investments always lay at the back of my mind, and I use it as a driving force because they always know, I always know that they will be there whether I fail or not. So I always want to make them proud and pay back for how much they've done for me. 
I feel confident that I'll win because I've had lots of preparation. I've been studying nonstop to win this tournament, and I feel like hopefully I'll be able to win everything. Ibrahim, that, that was a beautiful profile. You know, I met his mother in the reception earlier today, and she's She's so proud to be here. They are following their moves every minute, you know. This is so important for them. They make a lot of sacrifices. And as he said in that video, parents are the driving force. They're the motivation. They make sacrifices for their kids to be able to come here and play chess. Speaking of which, Ino Sedora, young Filipino player, his parents have made a lot of sacrifices for him to come and study here in the U.S. and to support his chess career from a very young age. How is he playing here? He is playing Franco Matamoros in round three with the white pieces. This looks crazy. He is absolute control of the center here. Am I wrong, Robert? No, you're absolutely right. And speaking of sacrifices, I would be tempted if I had the white pieces to immediately jump my knight into f6. I don't believe it quite works just yet because the idea is to give a check and attack this h7 pawn. But I'm putting my knight on pre. You can take it on f6. And now I'll be tempted to go pawn takes f6 with the immediate threat of queen g5 check followed by queen g7 checkmate. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite pan out. The simple move, king h8, looks to stop the checkmating threats because I will next move my rook to g8, and there's no mate from there. But sacrifice is so close. It's everywhere. It is close, especially when you control the center with such power, pawn on d5, pawn on e5. Let's go back to that position. Instead of knight f6, are there any other possibilities? Is it white's move? Yes, it is. It's Eno's move. How do you think he should continue here? He's got to defend the pawn on d5 because, let's face it, if he loses that pawn, he's going to lose his advantage slowly as the center disintegrates. How can he continue his kingside attack here? Yeah, it's about both in continuing his kingside attack and preventing Madame Morris's queenside attack. We see these two menacing pawns aiming to push themselves towards the, black, uh, the white king. White, again, could try a move like queen to g3, trying to put this knight in f6. Unfortunately, it also runs into bishop f5. So there are all these things to keep in mind here. There's no real clear-cut move at the moment. I think the position is very double-edged. Either side can make an immediate mistake and be losing on the spot. So I think that with white's move, it's time to sit down, really concentrate, and spend some time to make your move. What about a move like knight d6? Yeah, knight d6 is a definite possibility, and it immediately threatens the c4 pawn. So knight d6 puts the pieces in, in play, it attacks black's advanced pawns, but perhaps black can continue with a move like c3. It and remains very double-edged. Perhaps queen e4, bishop d3, because I think that was the original idea of a move like knight d6, is to tempt you to take on d5, or to make you push the c4 pawn, so that white can get his bishop to d3 and start creating a battery along the b1, h7 diagonal. For example, a move like bishop d3, how would that work here? Would that work? Well, bishop d3 is definitely possible. There is some concern about this pawn on d5. Perhaps you can take it with a knight. But also, it depends whose attack is coming first. I think bishop d3 at the moment is very strong, and I want to take back one move. What if I start instead with the pawn to b3, directly threatening your pawn on a2, trying to get in there with the queen? And my next move, if you move a3, it's move c3, and now the attack looks really strong. That definitely does, because now if c3, bishop d3, as you can show on the board, now you have the very strong c2, and it's very different from before. So white's idea would be trying to, to push that c4 pawn out of the way without getting this kind of position. Lawrence, how do you think white can achieve this? I love these positions. You know, these are the positions that are really exciting for the crowd, for the audience watching, because we're, oh, excuse me, that looks, I've got a random pawn in the middle. I don't know why that's there. How did that get there? Somebody get that pawn off the board. It's illegal. Let me try and do this again. Sorry, there you go, just in case you were looking at the position. Um, these are great because it's really a one move position. One wrong move and it's all over. And it's, it's as simple as that. If white goes wrong here, he can lose. Black goes wrong, he can lose. Um, so we've got a really complex battle. Actually, what the computer is saying is that it should end in a draw, just like most chess positions, but it's a really interesting way. Robert was absolutely right. If white plays knight d6, the problem is this b3 move is really awkward to deal with. Threatening to come down here with the queen, 
White would have to push up with A3 and then C3, as Robert said, and suddenly it's all falling in part. In fact, what White has to do in this position, if he wants to stay alive, is play the sneaky looking and very computer-like Queen of Three. This is not a very human move. It doesn't make much sense. And as it, it, it doesn't put the Queen on the G line, which is what we always look at in these kinds of positions. It just puts it on this diagonal to indirectly, oh, that's a, my arrows are all over the place this morning, um, to indirectly defend this pawn on d5. So black cannot actually take this pawn on d5. Nice little tactic. If you take that off, white has got the beautiful rook takes knight. And the point is, if the queen takes the rook, the knight comes in, check, and there's a discovered attack, winning the queen. So actually, after queen here, black would have to move his bishop out to b7, but now white moves his queen onto the g line. So he's distracted the bishop away from this diagonal. And actually, what happens is, it's a bit complicated, but we have a forced repetition of moves. And this is the best way to do it. You play queen f5, knight f6, ends in a draw, all very complicated, all very boring for everybody at home. It's not going to happen. Black's going to win. <laughs> all very happen. complicated, Lawrence. But in these positions, it's all about calculation. And I believe that the young Filipino player has it right, that's right down his alley. He's a calculator. So with that, before we get stuck into the rest of the games, let's take a short commercial break. Until recently, chess was like this. Chess 24 brought you this. Live interactive broadcasts from top tournaments with computer analysis and video commentary by the likes of Jan Gustafsson, Lawrence Trent and Peter Fiddler. A play zone where you can take on opponents from all around the world 24-7. Interactive beginners courses ensuring you pick up the basics fast while having fun. A tactics trainer to sharpen your chess by solving puzzles adapted to your level. Hundreds of interactive videos, letting you watch and learn from star players such as Vichy Anand, Peter Svidler, Paco Vajejo, and Hu Yufan. You've given up on that outdated computer? That's why there are more reasons to use Chess24 on mobiles and tablets. Full play zone access, including pre-move. A tactics trainer so you can stay sharp wherever you are. Computer opponents you can challenge even when you're not online live broadcasts of top chess events and the half it's free well that's half true most features are free but limited for registered members for a mere $13.99 per month however you can step up to premium membership and gain unlimited access to our video library that and much more make chess 24 your playground Reese Ashley, welcome back to the Millionaire Chess Open. Here live from Planet Hollywood, Las Vegas, over 550 players vying for that $1 million prize fund. We have a quite exciting little prize instrument here, the Bounty. Lawrence, tell us more about that. Well, as if $100,000 and the rest of it wasn't enough, Another very unique aspect of this tournament is that if one of the top five seeds of the open tournament, so in other words, the likes of Wesley So, the likes of Bujanji, were to lose against a lower rated opponent in the first five rounds, the winner, i.e. The, the underdog in that game, he's gonna be rewarded for his efforts of being such a spectacular player and actually win an extra $1,000. So there's a bounty on the head of all of the top five players in the open section. And we had our first bounty winner yesterday, the Chinese player, Wan Yunggo, who defeated Le Quang Liem, will be rewarded with $1,000. If I was him, I'd take it right downstairs, put it all on black, because hey, it's 50-50, bit like chess. Speaking of players that can upset the top seeds, let's have a look at Latvian Grandmaster Kulaots who is playing a very interesting game against young prodigy Samuel Shanklin from the United States. This is a very interesting position. Black has some double pawns here on the D-file, but white has an extremely dangerous uh, king position here. Robert, tell us more. Yeah, the position is very dynamic. The bishop on B7 is blunted by this pawn on D5. 
If I were black, I would just throw that pawn off the board and deliver checkmate with my queen to g2. Unfortunately, in chess, it's not possible. Black is actually up a pawn, and it's that stinking pawn on d5. The rook on a3 is about to swing into the action, either through e3 or perhaps to h3 and deliver an attack on the black king. However, in an opposite color bishop ending, you never know what's going to happen. So both sides have to be careful, but this uh, white king is very vulnerable. I would start with the move rook to f8, seizing the open file, competing for the f file with that white rook, and from there, it's anybody's game. I think black has the slightly better odds, but you never know in these types of positions. Yeah, these opposite colored positions in the middle game, it's all about king safety, and that pawn on d5 is a bit like what Lawrence would call one of those girlfriends he just wants to get rid of. It's kind of the pawn up you just don't want, because without that pawn, that bishop on b7 would be completely free, and delivering mate along that long white diagonal from h1 to a8. Is there any way that we can sacrifice a pawn? I don't think so. I mean, with that bishop on d4, that strong pose, it's practically impossible to get rid of the d5 pawn. How else could black attack here? Can he think about maybe doubling on the f file? But if we exchange rooks, then the advantage of the king being open slowly diminishes. Yeah, white would love to start trading pieces to protect his king. At the same time, black has the option of rerouting that bishop, going back to its original square, and coming into the action through g4. But if you're white, you also have options to attack. Rook to e1, putting immediate pressure on the black queen. From there, the idea is to go to e7, launching pressure on this g7 square. You know, it's really anybody's game here. I, again, I have to reiterate that black is in the better position, but anything can happen, especially under the pressure of the $100,000 first place prize. Lawrence, how would you play this position? Well, Robert, you're clearly an amateur. I don't mean in a chess sense, but if you're going to cheat, cheat well. Don't just throw the pawn off the board. You've got to sneeze. Hushu! Get that, you know, the, the, at least that way you can try and claim it genuinely. Picking it up, that's not going to work. You're right, though. If we could get this pawn off the board by some miracle, black would be just winning because the bishop is blunted. The position is favorable for black, though, in my opinion, because what black has is a lovely little square on e4 for potentially all of his pieces. The queen, the rook, and the bishop would all sit nicely there. I like your idea of rerouting via c8 very much. Um, I think that's, uh, well, not in this particular position, but certainly at some point. However, if I had to go with my gut, I think Kaido has got things just about under control. He's never moving that bishop. He can always support it. I think it's a key feature here that if bishop ever gets attacked, I don't know, via rook c8 and rook down here, he can always just play the move c3, just bolstering it nice and tight in the center. And I don't think that Sam has got enough. I'm going to bet on a draw in this one. Yeah, I think this the fourth strongest Latvian to ever come out of Latvia as a grandmaster. He's definitely got this reputation for punishing stronger players if they misbehave. And in this case, I don't think Sam is going to over push this one. I have to agree with Lawrence. It probably will be a draw if Kaido plays accurately. How would you assess this from, you know, as a grandmaster, you're in the third round. You, you know you have to win. If you want to get that $100,000 prize or be in the top three, top five, you know that you have to start winning from the very beginning. Draws aren't good. How would you press here? Where, where is the line that you would draw? Well, I don't think it's time to overpress quite yet. They're 2-0. and oh. They're two of 21 players who have that undefeated score. So there's not panic time yet. Sam Shanklin with the black pieces in this round would probably be content with the draw but given the position and given his fighting spirit, he wants to crush his opponent. So if I were playing, I would be a little more level-headed, a little more cautious. But Sam, he's an aggressive chess player. I would not be surprised if he overextended and ended up in defeat. The statistics are giving him a 71% chance of winning here. I think that's a bit high. Uh, in practical terms, I, don't, I can't quite see, besides rerouting the bishop, from c8 how black is going to proceed here because let's not forget white also has some ideas here of perhaps doubling on the f file maybe exchanging some pieces along the e file and you know even getting that queen active perhaps on c3 at some point yeah definitely and it remains to be seen but another interesting game that just caught my eye is the game between varuja nakobian 
and Youngwo Wan. Youngwo Wan was our hero of last night's uh, round. He beat the three seed, and now he's trying to upset another top grandmaster. But his position does not look so good. Ariane, his pieces are all in, in their back squares. His knight just went backwards to e8. The bishop is still on his home square of c8. Wow. The rook has no options to move. Very interesting position. What opening did this come from, Robert? Was this a King's Indian or a Benoni? It, this came from a King's Indian, you're right. It's a very well-known variation called the Four Pawns Attack. We won't get too uh, deep into the theory, but this is actually quite a typical position uh, in these kinds of lines where White has got this very nice-looking D5 pawn right here in the center, nice and protected by these two guys, means that in the long term it could be potentially dangerous. However, Black does have a trump in this position, and that is that, yes, Robert's right. This knight on e8 looks a bit clumsy at the moment, but he's going to kick this knight away from b5, and as soon as this knight goes, he's going to plonk it right onto d6. And let me tell you, as a lot of you chess players out there will already know, the best blockaders of pawns are knights, especially protected pass pawns, and the knight on d6 does a tremendous job of covering this weak f5 square, hitting these pawns. I still think white's a bit better because ideally I'd love to just put this pawn from g5, if we can see it here, put this right back on g6 just to give extra cover to this weak square. If we could do that, I'd actually prefer black in the position, but at the moment with the pawn on g5, he does have an issue there. I think things are a bit better for white, but nothing too critical at the moment. Thank you, Lawrence. Let's have a look at one of the other youngsters who had an upset yesterday. He beat Grandmaster Drev. He's here with the white pieces against Zhao Jinshao. This looks very good for white, actually, doesn't it, Robert? Yeah, and Jeffrey had a late night last night, winning at, you know, well past midnight. But it looks like he has a great position right now. The double A pawns do not play in black's favor, but you can protect it. If I were black, I'd start with this move a4. One, it doesn't lose the pawn. Two, it's protected by this bishop on d7. And it's actually very difficult to attack it if you're white. The bishop on c4 is limited. The knight on e4 looks very nice, but it's only attacking the pawn on c5. And with an extra pawn and an open b file for these rooks, I think eventually black may have the better of this position. Right, if black can manage to keep that pawn on a4, the young Jeffrey might be in trouble, but if not, then I think that white might have a good position. It depends, whose move is it right now? Well, it, it, it was before the move a4, it is black's move. Okay. So the pawn will be defended. I imagine that move will be played sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And so I think I like black's chances at the moment. What are some possibilities for white to play here? You know, I'm not even sure. I think at some point you're gonna have to remove that bishop on c4, maybe reroute it from through a2 to b1, to c2, but that's a long time coming. I don't think you have time for that. And Robert, what about a move like d4, and if you take on d4, the queen takes the knight on e7? Yeah, d4 is definitely a possibility, and it might be uh, possible to play it right now. I was a little concerned about pawn takes d4, but I see the queen takes e7, and that knight is, is lost, and now the bishop is also under attack if you take on c4. Queen takes d7, and white somehow makes it out up a piece. So that move d4 may be a possibility in that position. How might black respond to a move like d4? Because the thing is, if he doesn't play a4, then that pawn will be under serious trouble. So to keep the pawn by playing a4, how would you respond to a move like d4? Because now the c5 pawn is under attack, and as you just showed us, you can't really take on d4 immediately. Yeah, and a possible response is bishop to b5, attempting to trade the bishops, and if you do trade, now my B pawn protects his A4 pawn. So you do give up the C5 pawn, but you do gain a B pawn to protect your weak pawn on A4. And the thing is that in this position, I would imagine this would be quite hard for black to win uh, if white sets up kind of a blockade on the black squares. Yeah, black, uh, white will set up a blockade in the black squares, white can set one up in the light squares, so it's really anybody's game, but you have to trust Zhao's technique. He's an experienced grandmaster. That's right. He's playing the younger player, so mm -hmm. I do think the position bodes well for him. Lawrence, I believe you have something to say. Yeah, absolutely. I've just had a little uh, bit of, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, um, the, wor uh, the, words, uh, the words are lost at the moment. I'm still waking up, guys. Give us a break. Um, 
I think this tournament is totally unfair, actually. I've just come to the conclusion. Anybody under the age of 21 has got a huge advantage, right? We're in Sin City. All of these guys are being tempted by gambling. You've got the shows going on. Then you've got guys like Jeffrey Zhong. I don't know if we can get a close-up of him there. Just sitting there nicely. You know, had a nice Egg McMuffin or something this morning. You know, chilled out, in bed by 10 o'clock. And then you've got the other guys who are being, you know, downstairs, <laughs> betting on the blackjack. I think this is. I think we need to re readjust the stats here. I, I think the kids have just got such a big advantage, and they're, they've got more energy naturally. There's Jeffrey. Does he look tired to you? He looks like he could run a marathon, come back, and he'd still look the same. But I tell you what, Dreyev did the same. He won't mind me saying this. Well, probably need a shower before he goes back on. But uh, looking at the position, um, I, you're ac absolutely right, you guys. A4, D4 is actually the best line with bishop B5. And when everything comes off, the pawn recaptures on c5. White's got a lovely square for his knight on d6. At some point, I think things are pretty much balanced. But as I say, you know, I'd rather be 13 than 33. So there you go. Are you sure Zhao Xingzhao is 33? He doesn't look that old. No, I'm just saying, I was just trying <laughs> to use another three. I, I, I don't know how, how old he is, but... Uh, well, if we're going to set the, the young age to be 13 or anything under 21, let's have a look at Alexander Lenderman, who I would still consider a junior, but I think he's about 22 right now. He's about 24, 25, 20, so wow, he's definitely okay. not a junior So he, he's an old man in chess terms, <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> uh, not quite that old, and he's playing with energy that you know he's been showing for the last couple months. He actually won his game. He defeated Jacek Stopa, and it was a really brutal finish. He's only up one pawn. But this bishop on c3, ooh, that's, that's worth a lot because it covers all the squares in front of the king. This rook on d7 now starts attacking the seventh rank, and there's no really good move for black. A move like rook c7 with the attempt to trade the rooks in the seventh rank really doesn't do that much. In fact, you can just pull this rook back to d6 if you want, or you can even trade, and once the trades start happening, white's pawn advantage will come through. That's right, and did Jessek just resign in this position, or did he play until the end? No, he resigned in this position. He understood that his opponent has played an excellent game, that his position is, practically speaking, lost, and perhaps he wanted to get some rest before the double round. As we saw yesterday, it's really tough to play two long games in a row, so he tipped his king over, and that was that. Something that we definitely wouldn't see in the lower boards, I would imagine that if these guys weren't grandmasters, that they would probably play on until the very end because on this level, we'll explain to the viewers that white is just considered winning. And so uh, black doesn't even bother to play on, would rather take the few hours extra rest before the fourth round. But I think that for the viewers, it would be better if these grandmasters would actually play on. What do you think, Robert? Yeah, definitely. It's always great to see fighting chess for them to play for hours and hours in that bitter battle. But at the same time, you have to respect the individual competing. What do you think, Lawrence? I, I fully sympathize with uh, uh, Stopper in this position because if we look at the game objectively, as Robert said, this rook is just going to mop up along the seventh rank. And if rook c7, you can just whip this guy off and play rook to d1, reactivating. And this check and then rook back to d7, winning the knight, well, I mean, you're going to pick up a lot of material. So I actually think Stopper's decision isn't premature. And I think he's thinking, well, there might be the Britney show on. You know, maybe he likes a bit of Britney, maybe he likes a bit of Rod Stewart. Uh, maybe he thought, damn, why am I going to stay here for three hours trying to grind a draw when really I can go and listen to a bit of, uh, what's that song she sung? Crazy? I, I, I never, hit me baby one more hit time. Hit me baby one more time. There you go. So maybe he's now down the road watching a bit of Britney. I think you're showing your age, Lawrence. I don't even remember that song. I just, I just know it because you sing I, it all I the time. I do because I went through puberty at that moment. <laughs> Speaking of puberty, let's have a look at Ray Robson, who is still very, very young. Young American grandmaster, the hope of American chess. How is he going here with the white pieces against John Bartholomew? His pieces look very strange. There is a bishop on b1. That bishop came through f1 to c4, back to a2, down to b1. So that is not the most typical maneuver. However, his rook on c2 is excellently placed. Black doesn't have that promising composition. I think if I'm white, you can even throw that knight into c6 right away, but you might want to keep that option open. So instead of that move, perhaps you can just start protecting your king side because as you can see, this knight on f4 is pretty menacing, 
the other knight may come to h4 and really put some serious pressure on the white king side. Yeah, these positions are always extremely interesting. I'm, I'm a Spanish player myself, and this is what you would call one of those, well, classic Spanish positions where white has pushed to d5, and we have this position with the bishops on b1, this diagonal, and it's always a bit, well, very interesting because it always depends which side of the board the players are playing on. I always like to play this with black. As we can see, perhaps the square on c6 is a bit weak, uh, but black has some, some play here on the king side. Black definitely has some play, but if I were white, I would start with the move knight to g4. And the idea is that my knight will be rerouted through e3 and maybe come to this f5 square. It also stops sacrificial ideas in the h3 square because the bishop on c8 is blunted by the knight on g4. It's hard for black to start an attack. Pawn to f5 is an idea, it's protected, but I might just re retreat with knight to e3. Pawn takes e4, looks like it wins a pawn, but perhaps white can just move, remove his rook from this diagonal, perhaps to c3, and the idea is to take on e4. But you always have to be careful. For one, there's a sacrifice, bishop takes h3. And if pawn takes h3, recapturing the bishop, knight takes h3 check, this pawn f2 is in grave danger. So perhaps white needs to be very, very careful despite black's positional weaknesses. I love these kind of positions, these Spanish positions. It always starts really close, really strategic, and then a bit of opening in the center, and fireworks go on, and it's all about calculation. Who calculates better? Lawrence. You love them, Ariane. I hate them. Let me tell you why. Because every time I play them with white, I lose, and every time I play them with black, I lose. Simple as that. Uh, for some reason, with white here, I managed to underestimate the attack. Eventually, this pawn comes down to h5. He breaks with g4, and I sign a score sheet and wish I'd never even turned up. And, uh, and, and when I'm black, somehow this knight manages to get its way to f5. So even though you might love this one, Ariane, well, I kind of hate it. And, uh, but it's, if I'm speaking on a slightly more serious note, it's very double-edged. Uh, who knows what's going to happen. We've got a close-up here of Mr. Ray Robson. He is playing with the white pieces in this game. He had a bit of a tricky game yesterday. He drew his match. Uh, he's on one and a half. He's no way near out of the tournament. A win today will keep him on track. I think he's still favorite. Um, I think from a positional perspective, this pos it's still very strong for white. This hole on f5, this knight can come into c6. And this bishop, even though it looks like it's doing nothing, actually does a brilliant job indirectly along this diagonal, stopping a lot of black's play. So I think that Ray's doing just about all right. But you don't ever want to underestimate black's chances, as Robert showed in the previous variation. Uh, one little sacrifice on h3, and it could all go wrong. So still very much two, all three results possible. Thank you, Lawrence. We are here with a very special guest who just won his game, Alexander Lenderman. How are you? You're on three out of three. How are you feeling? That seemed like a breeze. Well, <laughs> I feel pretty good. Um, it was uh, an interesting game. Uh, actually, um, I, I, was I think I was very fortunate to win this game. Um, I, I thought this game was heading towards a draw at one point, but uh, you know, my opponent made some inaccuracies and suddenly I got a pretty good position. And uh, Would you be able to point out the, the tipping point of where that balance suddenly came from a very George position? What was the critical moment in this position? Well, right here after queen takes e2, knight takes e2, king h1. So I really expected knight takes c1 because, um, you know, in an open position with rooks on the board, you know, usually rook and bishop is slightly better than rook and knight. Um, and I thought he should eliminate this knight, I mean the bishop. I, I have to take back, rook, take, rook a takes c1 probably. And then I thought either take on f5 is probably fine, or maybe even rook a d8. Um, you know, because in the rook n game, you know, piece activity is, uh, rook activity is very important in the king activity. And uh, I think uh, black should draw pretty much without too much problems. Yeah, Alex, I thought the same thing, but as the game went on, it looked like you were building up an initiative because he started letting your bishop out. And as yeah. you said, in these kind of positions, with the bishop out, it becomes really deadly. And by the time the end happened, we see your bishop on c3, really a menacing piece. Well, still, he should not uh, 
lose like this, of course, even uh, in this uh, bishop against knight, but there was already some pressure on him to create concretely some specific counterplay, otherwise he would he could be grounded out. It's, I've seen a lot of examples like this with bishop, can, bishop against knight with rooks where it seemed like nothing special, but then suddenly, you know, um, the side with the bishop gets some annoying play. Well, obviously, at a critical moment like that where he could have taken your bishop and probably after a few moves shaking hands, it's a draw. Yeah. What psychological factors do you think might have played in that position? He's, he's obviously, he's an international master, so he's weaker than you, he's under pressure to try and make a draw. What, what, how do you think he made that, well, we could say even an obvious decision of, of making the wrong move and not taking the, the bishop on c1? Well, I don't think, first of all, he's a weaker player, and I, I, don't, I certainly don't think he considers himself an inferior player. I mean, he's a... Uh, not. Well, you're, you're a few hundred <coughs> points higher than him. Well, actually only less than 100, first of all. And okay, he's an IM with over 2,500, and uh, he really is probably close to GM strength. And uh, he's a very, <coughs> he's, a, he's a good tactical player. Uh, so he probably wanted to keep some dynamics on the board. He was still maybe thinking of trying to have winning chances instead of just having game Peter out to draw. And, uh, well, I mean, I respect his decision. I think it's just uh, chess-wise, it was probably a, a wrong decision. But, um, you know, I guess I got fortunate here. So you took advantage of his emotional decision to try and beat you. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, it's not necessarily that he just tried to beat me at all costs, but he was just trying to keep some tension on the board to have winning chances. But uh, that played into my hand because, you know, obviously, I also got winning chances like that. Well, that's what it's all about here. If you want to keep winning, you got to keep calm, keep cool, and keep your evaluation objective. Thank can you so much. Can I butt in there? Oh, Do you mind? absolutely. Alexander, can I just get you to say co coffee? Because I love the New York coffee. Can, do you, do you, I heard it in Kos. Can you do coffee, like the real New York? And the what? I don't understand. Just say coffee for me. It'll really cheer me up. Coffee. There we go. <laughs> love that. God. <laughs> Sorry, nothing about the game. Back to you, <laughs> Well, Lawrence, you are always coming up with surprises, and we love your accent, Alexander. We, we'd Thank love you. to have you back. Good luck for the rest of the tournament, and rest up before round four. Thank you very much. Nice. Thanks for having me. Back to you, Lawrence. All right, so Alexander Lenneman there. You know, this guy, he's, a, he's, he's not to be underestimated. After all, he came equal first in the U.S. Championships, lost on tiebreak, but uh, in the playoffs, I should say. He's had a great year so far. I remember Alexander, he's walking past me in my peripheral, but I remember him, I think he beat Mickey Adams, right? Or was it a draw? He was pressuring, it was a draw, earlier this year in a rook ending, so he knows a lot about his stuff, uh, his rook ending, certainly. And uh, uh, as he said, very important point, mobility of your pieces. If you have active pieces, a lot of the time, that compensates for having a material disadvantage. So. Well done to him, that means he's on 100%. He's gonna be probably on the top boards tomorrow if everything goes as planned. In other news, perhaps we can just go through a couple of the games still in progress. Wesley So on board one. This is the position, I like what Wesley has done. He swapped a few pieces off and we've got the current position. If we look, Alejandro Ramirez, clearly in a very aggressive mood, He's just moved his rook over to h5, swung that guy over, looking at this h2 pawn. And he obviously would love to take that, so Wesley's just played h3. Looks aggressive, a bit like one of my... No, I can't keep on using that joke, although it's true. Um, it's, it looks aggressive, but nothing's going on. Uh, I think Wesley's absolutely fine. And Alejandro has to be a bit careful that this rook doesn't get sidelined here, so uh, we'll see what happens in that one. Robert, what do you think? I think that Wesley is just... He knows what he's doing here. He's exchanging a few pieces. He's simplifying. And he, he knows that after a bit of simplification, he's going to be slightly better. Yeah, and a big occurrence just happened. And I think we'll... we'll I missed yeah. it. Hands up. <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> a big happening just hit, went here. Queen to d6. The idea is to deliver checkmate, pr protected by the knight on g4. The problem with removing that knight on g4 is now queen h2 is still mate because removing the h3 pawn opened the rook in the queen's defense. However... Wesley So is not going to blunder the checkmate. And after queen to d6, he went rook fc1. This is fascinating development here because the idea, if queen h2 check, king f1, it looks very scary, but 
but queen h1 check doesn't do anything. King e2, and now your queen is under attack. We don't like our king in the center, but here it's great, because after queen takes g2, we deliver not pawn takes g4 winning the knight. We deliver queen c8 check. And after rook takes queen, we take this rook back, delivering a checkmate on the king. So while the, the game position will not occur to be queen h2 check and these mistakes, it looks very double-edged. I think it does look a bit double-edged. The statistics are saying 50-50 for both sides. But my money is on Wesley So here. He's playing extremely solid chess lately. He knows what he's doing. And this is great. You can see that this is the style that he's really developed, especially probably after working with Magnus Carlsen a few years ago. He's developed this kind of style where he just wants to be slightly better or just get a position that he can play and slowly convert that point. He's kind of lost that, that Filipino touch, with, which all the Filipinos seem to, to love, is that very tactical, aggressive play. They just you know, they want these King's Indian positions and then just fireworks. He's kind of deviated from that and just played extremely solid chess. Openings like the Berlin and then just slowly getting an advantage and playing very unlike his compatriots. It's interesting to me where he got that style because if you look at the other, the previous Filipino protege, Mark Paragua, or as we call him, Mac Mac, who plays a lot here in the United States, very opposite. King's Indian, all of these open positions, crazy chess. Where did he get this heritage of, of solid chess? Because he grew up in the Philippines, he started playing there. I would assume that his first coaches were Filipino. So it's interesting where he was educated in this solid, kind of more, well, strategic kind of play. Simple answer, Ariane. Very simple answer. <laughs> you don't get to 2755 without being an all-rounder. You just can't get there. And as he's matured as a man, as a player, you learn how to play different styles. Yes, he was very, I remember looking at his games when he was a bit younger, he's still extremely young, of course, but he was, and he was a very attacking player, as you said. But his style, you have to be able to play everything at this level, and he does that. I love the position, though, and I'm really uh, uh, excited at analyzing this one. He's a, very confident, but actually, it's far from clear what's going on. The threat of this queen c8 with a back rank checkmate, as Robert illustrated before, is really important. But there's a really nice idea that I, is quite far-fetched, but I think Alejandro, by process of elimination, is going to see it. What's going to happen is he's going to realize he can't move the knight back because queen c8 check is going to win a lot of material. So he's going to play queen down check, looks threatening, the king has to shoot across, and now what he has to play is this brilliant move, knight takes e3, just giving up the knight for a pawn. But the point is that after pawn takes e3, yes, white still has got this threat of coming down to, oh my goodness, the queen can't move like that. That's my mouse, ladies and gentlemen. The queen wants to come down still to c8, but what black can do now is play the cute little move rook to e8, just eyeing up this pawn. For the moment, he's a piece down, but let's have a look at this knight. Knights on the rim are dim. In German, spring am Rand, bring common shan. It's a bit strong. It means knights bring shame. I don't think it's so shameful there on, but it doesn't participate in helping. And remember this queen and this rook and this rook are all playing in the attack. I'd be a bit worried here with white. You've got to play, worry about moves like g6, rook f5 check are in the air. And if you don't act quickly, it's actually Wesley So who can end up on the receiving end. So if Alejandro Ramirez finds knight takes e3, and he's a very good tactical player, then who knows? I think all three results are possible. What do you think, Robert? Yeah, I think it's definitely possible. I think he will find it. Not necessarily because uh, it's his first thought, but because it might be his only option. His position looks quite difficult if he doesn't go for this. In the game where we have this position here, as Lawrence mentioned, if he retreats with his knight, he still has to be concerned about these back rank problems. That being said, with no other option but to go forward, queen h2 check, king f1, knight takes e3, pawn takes rook e8, just like Lawrence just suggested, I think he'll find it because he has no other choice. This is going to be a fascinating game. It's far from over. Alejandro here thinking very deeply about his next move, which might prove to be decisive. And with that, we are going to take a 10-minute break. But before you go, I'm going to let you know that we're going to have up there on the screen, guess the winning move. 
And when we come back in 10 minutes, we want you to solve that puzzle. We'll flash up the solution and you'll know if you got it right or wrong. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Don't go away.
welcome back to round three of the Millionaire Chess Open, live here from Planet Hollywood, Las Vegas. Before we get right into the games with Grandmaster Robert Hess, let's have a look at the solution to Guess the Move with Lawrence. Yes, I remember back in 1891, I used to play a bit of chess down the club, you know. My friends Henry Bird and George Gossip, great chaps, used to, you know, have a little smoke during the game, maybe have some tea. Back in 1891, wear a nice suit, nice little pocket handkerchief. Well, actually, in this game, I wasn't there, a bit too young for that, but great little solution if you did get it. In this position, white to play, how did he fill off, fill off? finish off George Gossip? Well, he did it with a spectacular little trick. It's a nice little trick, nice little motif. Remember this one because you will use it in your own games. White to move. All he has to do is play the move rook takes f8 check. Beautiful elimination move because you get rid of this defender of the e6 pawn. Rook takes f8 and then bishop takes e6 with check. And the point is if the bishop now takes, you don't recapture with a knight, but you play what is called an intermediate move. And you play rook takes rook First, and the point is you lure the king to the f8 square and then play knight takes e6 with the deadly threat of winning the queen. Nothing black can do but resign, go back down to his jolly old chaps back home, have a little cup of tea and maybe some biscuits. That's about it. We hope you enjoyed that puzzle during the break. Keep watching because we're going to throw up a lot more puzzles for the day. But before we do, let's go and have a look at young Chinese grandmaster and gold medalist Yu Yang Yi. How is he doing, Robert? Yu Yang Yi is playing excellent, excellent chess. He's trying to throw down the hammer on Conrad Holt. Stop the Thunder Holt. He just went to move queen to b6. He relieved himself of the pin from this bishop on h4 and is directly attacking the knight on b5. And if bishop takes f6, black will play the intermediate move queen takes b5. Instead of crippling his king side with g takes f6, he re regains the piece, keeps his king side intact, and now is threatening to further mobilize his pieces, and white is looking like he's in some trouble. So Yu Yang Yi is in position to continue his undefeated streak and become 3-0, and my money is on him. Thank you, Robert. What about some other games we can have a look at uh, before we go to our MC correspondent, Alexandra? Well, Sam Shanklin and Kaido Kuleots just drew their game. Uh, it was, as we predicted, that it would peter out into a draw. He managed to hold both sides, not take too many risks. It's early in the tournament, and it was a draw by repetition. Just a few moves ago, they went rook e7, threatening rook takes g7 check, which would be disastrous. Rook f7, rook e8 check, only move rook f8, and after rook e7, rook f7, rook e8 check, they shook hands three-move repetition, drawn game. I would think that that would be a little bit disappointing for Sam Shanklin, but then again, the Grandmaster from Estonia, Kaido Kolaots, definitely is a bit unpredictable with the stronger GMs, and I think he's going to be a bit of a wild card here, vying for the top places. Let's go to Alexandra, who has something for us. Thanks, Ariane. It's, um, the energy in here is palpable, and it's so intense. It's like I can feel it in here. It's so quiet. But as you can see, everyone's in there for round three of day two. I just wanted to feature some of the merchandise in here. Everyone's playing on the specially designed millionaire chess boards. And it's for the Reykjavik set to play homage, pay homage to the 1972 match. Of course, Fischer Spassky, the world championship map that garnered the world's attention. Boris Ashley specially designed this set because he wanted to achieve the same thing, essentially, and bring this game into the mainstream. Every player got a specially designed millionaire chess bag, and you'll see that went upon registration. This is where they can keep their board, their chess pieces go on the side, you can keep your laptop and everything. And that's a special gift that was designed by Amy Lee's brother, Eric Lee, a family of feral course. We just wanted to have every element of this tournament be personalized and, of course, one of a kind. This is the first tournament to actually put this much effort in some of the things that are featured. And, of course, I, I, I need to throw to the amazing commercial that Fat Champ cut for us to show us some of the merchandise that's on sale on MillionaireChess.com.
So the next time you're going to see me, I'm going to go inside that broadcasting room because I think you guys need to see what Robert, Marianne, and Lawrence look like on set. Are you guys okay with that? Thanks, Alexandra. I don't know if we're okay with that. I think Lawrence is okay with that. He's always looking good, always high energy, ready to be right in front of the camera. Robert, how are you feeling? Feeling great. I mean, it's great to be here. It's an exciting round of chess, so I'm very happy. Yeah, and that merchandise just looks fantastic. Make sure to go and get your piece on millionairechess.com and make sure to join us on the Twitter sphere with hashtag millionairechess. Now, Robert, let's go straight into a very exciting game here with Armenian born American grandmaster Varujan Akopian. Yeah, Var is playing great chess right now. Uh, yesterday, he had an up and down battle. He should have won his game, only managed to draw. And as the highest player with one and a half points, goes up to play the 2 0, Young Guo Wan, who upset Le Quang Liam, the third seed. But in this game, the upset specialist looks like he's going to be upset after the round because he has sacrificed a pawn just a few moves ago after knight to a4, he went f5, hoping to gain more space. Pawn takes f5 was the natural reply, winning a pawn, and after e4, opening up this bishop on that long diagonal, white simply retreated bishop c2. The pawn on b2 is actually very well defended by this knight on a4. The knight on a4 is coming to the attack of the c5 pawn, and if the bishop comes to the, the defense of the c5 pawn and the attack on this knight and the pin to the rook, now you have big trouble brewing on this h6 pawn. The king on g8 is just too weak to go for that. I think Var is well on his way to a victory this round. Do you think there are some psychological factors at play here, Robert, with one winning yesterday, uh, quite a big upset, is that right? And now, you know, he's thinking, well, why can't I have another upset against Varu Jacobian? Maybe he's making some emotional decisions here. Yeah, I mean, he must have been a high last night after a huge win. But Var is a very calm player. He generally plays the position and not the opponent. So he's very level-headed. He'll play objective chess. And right now, he definitely knows that he's on the winning side of this position. So I am guaranteeing a Varuja Nakobian victory. Lawrence, I believe you've got a few words to say. All these guarantees you're given, Robert. You know, I might need you as my insurance provider. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I'm not as certain as you. You know, I like my bishops. Black has got the two bishops here. I do believe white is better. With that, I'm absolutely uh, in agreement with you. But you know what? I think black's got a lovely little move that he can play here that can just about hold the fort. And it's a really nice, what we call prophylactic move. That means that it's a move preparing against a potential threat. And the move that black has is the move rook to a7. Looks strange, but actually the idea is to bring the rook over to the defense of the king when required. And if white were to take this pawn on c5, that would run into a huge problem after the move queen b6, just x-raying these knights. White will lose material. And if he doesn't do that, well, black in the next couple of moves, he's going to play bishop to d4, and then this rook is going to swing over to g7 or h7, just covering all the important squares. And we saw how yesterday, Wan, when he was under a bit of pressure against Le Quang Liem, he still managed to hold in there and ended up beating Le Quang despite having an inferior position. And today, he's in the same situation, so he's going to remain calm. If he plays rook a7, which I really believe is the best move, not an impossible move to see either, I think he could hold his ground. Thanks, Lawrence. Let's have a look at the young Italian grandmaster, Sabino Brunella, who is playing an Azeri grandmaster, Ralph Mamedov. It looks like black might be slightly better here, but white seems very active. What do you think, Robert? Yeah, Ralph Mamedov has been active all tournament. We saw his crazy game a couple of rounds ago. In the first round, he was worse. In the last round, he had a crazy attack before make a smart decision to trade queens. Here, he is down a pawn. Black is up the c6 pawn, whereas there's no white counterpart on the c-file. However, there is some activity with the rook on e1 and the knight on e5. But if I were black, I'd make a simple move knight f6. I also have an outpost for my knight right here on e4. The pawn on f5 makes it a nice square for the knight, and I think that he's much better, and it shows. It says 83% probability that he'll win. I think that's very high. I think realistically, there's more chances in the position for white to try to salvage a draw, but at the same time, the favor is definitely Blacks. Yeah, it's always exciting to watch Sabina play. He's lost a lot of rating recently, but that definitely is not determinant of the way he's playing here. I think he's, he's in for it 
a win in round three against uh, the very strong top-seeded player, Ralph Mehmedov. And if he can pull this off, that's, that's a big win. Yeah, I think it's a bounty prize win too, right? They're on one of those top five boards. So Sabino Brunel will be a very happy man if he pulls off. He gets his entry fee back at the very minimum, $1,000. And he's fighting for the top prizes. So. And he gets back some of those rating points. <laughs> that too. That's always important for a chess player. You so know what they say though, right? <laughs> a pawn's, well, it's a very famous saying. Confucius said it in 200 AD, BC. When was <laughs> Confucius around? Can't remember. It wasn't one of my friends. He said, a pawn is a pawn. It's something along those lines. Um, Did Bobby Fisher say Oh, no, it was either Fisher or Confucius. <laughs> I can never remember. <laughs> But a pawn's a pawn, right? Only Brunello can win. He's playing for two results, and that's what we love as chess players, playing for two results. Long way off, but yeah, I, I kind of fancy Sabino, actually. I think he's got good chances. Lawrence, always insightful there with your quotes. Let's have a look at one of our favorite youngsters studying here in the United States, Filipina-born Ino Sadora. He's playing here with the white pieces. Last time we had a look at this game. It seemed very double-edged. It looks like he's managed to get the c4 pawn out of the way, but he's lost his white bishop in the process. Tell us more. Yeah, he sacrificed his bishop for that pawn on c4. So he right now has one pawn for the bishop. However, he did get rid of a dangerous attacking piece. He has some huge threats coming up if he can get his knight to g5 and put pressure on this h7 pawn. Unfortunately, at the moment, the d5 pawn is also very weak. The first thought that comes to mind is move knight to d6. It attacks the queen and puts pressure on f7. However, it looks like it might run into queen to d7, both protecting your queen and the pawn. But this move, pawn to e6, looks very, very dangerous. I think white has enough counterplay to keep him in the game for now, but also I think he has great winning chances. Wow, this looks like a really, really exciting position. You know, going for it there, sacrificing his bishop to get complete control of the center. How might black defend this kind of position? Is there, is there any way? Yeah, there's definitely a way. And I think that with, this is a very likely uh, occurrence in this game. And I, I really am having trouble seeing how. I think maybe queen e7 is a possibility. But after knight takes f7 check, king to g8, Sure, the attack isn't so immediate, but there are definite problems. The black king has no moves. There are two pass pawns in the center. However, you give black another move, there is a the potential of knight takes d5 here. So if rook c7 looks like a great attacking chance hitting the queen, there might be this wonderful intermediate move, knight takes d5. Might just not work at the very moment, but you always have to be careful of this try. Because if rook takes d5, I have queen takes e6, and now it's anyone's game. This king is also very weak. The queen is threatening to come down. The rook is under attack. There's pressure on this knight. Really unclear, complicated position. Well, that probably explains the statistics that are up there, giving it a 50-50 chance. I know that we're probably favoring white in this position, but as you just showed, there, is, there are a few counterplay measures that Carlos could pull out. What about you, Lawrence? What do you think? This is another great example of where humans and computers really differ. Computers can find the only defenses in really tactical positions very easily, whereas humans, over the board, they get nervous, they get sweaty palms, they realize they haven't paid their rent, and it all goes wrong. In this particular position, <laughs> Carlos Matamoros, he's got a big, big decision to make. Where is he going to move that queen? White has jumped into d6, as Robert said. Very, very good move. Just hitting the queen, hitting f7. The best move is actually to play something that you wouldn't really even consider. Well, you would consider it, but it would be one of the lesser uh, moves you'd consider. It's the move queen to e2. Looks strange, right? But it's got the idea of just keeping an eye on this e6 square indirectly and maybe bringing the queen back to the defense uh, via h5. And things aren't so clear. So although the computer would happily defend this position with black. If you're playing over the board, I can tell you, well, he's just played queen e2, so what do I know? Um, he's played it, which is a great move. But over the board, this is a really tricky position. But Carlos Matamoros, I can tell you, lived in Spain for a very long time. Uh, the only, or the first Ecuadorian grandmaster, I should say, he's got a lot of experience, and he looks kind of calm. He's probably thinking, I'm glad I didn't wear my opponent's shirt today. That thing is outrageous. Back to you, Ariane. Well, Lawrence, always with the very best dress sense and style. 
Let's have a look at a player that we haven't really looked at yet. It's third round already. Let's look at one of the best sportsmen of, that has ever come out of Iran. A bit of a superstar in his country, Grandmaster Esan Gayem Maghami. Hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Robert, how is it looking? You know, it's looking quite double-edged here. I think the game will eventually peter out into a draw, but you have to take into account Black's extra pawn. But that extra pawn is a doubled one because they're on e7, e6, there are two. That leaves four for black on the king side to three for white. There's a weak pawn on c6 as well as a weak pawn on a2. The bishop for white is much better than knight on uh, c5, but I think white is just enough to keep the balance. For example, rook f3 check forces the king away from protecting this pawn. And if the king moves to g7, now we need to create space for our king because we don't want to run to a blunder. If I try to go rook back to e3, now it's big trouble. Rook takes c4 is game over because rook takes c4 allows rook d1 and that back rank is killer as we've seen plenty of times before. So instead, he decided to go h3 in the original position. He's giving his king space, he's taking his time. Black can't really accomplish too much. I think the game soon peters out into a draw and these players go on with two and a half out of three. Thank you, Robert. And let's go to a very interesting game that Lawrence has pulled out. It's Conrad, I believe, who's playing. Yeah, Conrad Hart versus Yu Yang Yi. You know on Facebook you can change your relationship update status. You, you know, you're married, you're engaged. It's complicated. Well, if this were a kind of Facebook format, you'd have to create a new one. And this is, it's very complicated. I don't know what the hell's going on. I know it doesn't really work as a marketing tool, but they should create it for this because this is complete bonkers. He's just played the move Rook takes A2. And the truth is, neither I, nor the machine, nor uh, Bobby, F well, he's not around. Uh, so anybody in the world really knows what's going on. It's just a complete mess. Um, any ideas, Robert? Because I'm struggling to decipher this one. This is a bit like me trying to read Chinese without a uh, Mandarin or something without even ever studied anything. I don't, might as well be looking at another game at the moment. <laughs> Well, the game is pretty crazy. Uh, it looks like both sides have great chances right now. I like Yu Yang's position more, a little more earlier on. Right now, they have equal material, so that bodes well for both sides. However, the counterplay that black has on the queen side is great. The bishop has a square on b3 to attack the queen. I would try to trade rooks if I were white here, and after bishop takes a2, well, this pawn on g7 is quite weak. The bishop on h7 doesn't really belong here, though. If you retreat, there's no really good square to retreat to, but if you retreat to, say, f5, then a move like bishop b3 is kind of annoying. It looks like black has more space. The knight can retreat to e6 in the near future. You know, I think that while the position may objectively be equal, I like black's chances, not only because he's the stronger player, but I think there's more opportunity to strategize and improve his position. Thank you, Robert. Now, I'd like to remind everybody that in a tournament such as this with such a big prize fund, in fact, the biggest prize fund ever in open tournament history. Security is a big matter, not only for the player's security, but in terms of cheating. Because, of course, we believe that all test players have integrity and will always play mano a mano, but we always have to take precautions. We have a small piece uh, looking at security here at Millionaire Chess with Tournament Director. Let's have a look at that. Okay, so find your places as quickly as possible. We want to make the announcements and then we want to start right on time at 11 a.m., please. So find your places quickly. One face we see wandering the tournament floor at the Millionaire Chess Open is Chief Arbiter Francisco Guadalupe. Although he's an experienced arbiter with the U.S. Chess Federation, he's never worked a tournament like this one. I've been the Chief Arbiter for many national and international events. Uh, probably the most prestigious being the U.S. Championship and Zonal Championship, uh, that is called also. I was the Chief uh, Arbiter for two Super Nationals where we had over 5,300 kids. But, you know, so in sheer numbers, those are bigger, or uh, the Super Nationals, that is. But as far as the price fund, the measures taken to ensure that there is no cheating and things like that, this is by far uh, the most uh, 
exciting that I've had, yes. With a million dollars in prizes on the line, Mr. Guadalupe and his team have taken steps to ensure the millionaire chess open meets the highest standards of security to limit the potential for cheating. A player can have uh, a chess program in a cell phone. And in fact, I know of many instances where there have been accusations of players cheating, going to the bathroom with their cell phone, uh, looking, you know, putting up their game and, you know, getting a computer, if you will, to give them the best move. Uh, that doesn't happen in this tournament because as uh, you have seen, we have uh, TSA type scanners just to go into the playing area and the same scanners, the TSA type scanners, body scanners, to go to the bathroom. So there is no way that a player can actually bring an electronic device to the playing area or to the bathroom. So that is very important. That at least gives the player a, a sense of uh, uh, fairness, that we're doing everything we can uh, to ensure uh, fair play. Also within the playing area, we have uh, cameras there. Uh, so the organizers have taken a lot of measures to make sure that with the, with the price on, uh, on you know, a stake here, $1 million, we have to make sure we do that. Ensuring only the highest of professional standards here at the Millionaire Chess Open. Security here is tight, but so is the money. It's big, and these players are playing for big dreams. Now let's jump straight into the key matchup of the round, Alejandro Ramirez versus top seed Wesley So. This is proving to be extremely exciting. Ramirez seems to have sacrificed something here, but with great play. Robert, let's assess this. Yeah, might as well be July 4th because there are fireworks on this board. He went rookie eight as we predicted. Lawrence and I were discussing this earlier, and now he made the ridiculous looking move, pawn to g4. At first, like, well, my king was already in trouble, so why would I push my pawns away from my king? Well, you're attacking this rook on h5 and simultaneously threatening the exchange of queens. If I try to keep the queens on board with queen takes h3 check, I run into queen g2. And from here, it's not so easy, because as the queens trade, that knight on a4, the knights in the rim may be dim, but when you have an extra knight, you're a pretty happy person. So that doesn't bode well for black. Instead, when we go g4, the idea of queen h1 check, king f2, queen h2 check, we'll see a draw by repetition because after king back to f1, they will just repeat the moves. Queen h1 check, queen h2 check, and I anticipate a draw to be on this board very shortly. Wow, Robert, you know, unfortunately, I say unfortunately, unfortunately this happens where it's just fireworks between these top players, but it peters out into a draw. It's so sad, I hope it doesn't happen. But anyway, these are the kind of positions where computers sometimes are a bit smarter and they definitely help us evaluate the position in case we miss anything. Lawrence, have you found anything? Yeah, um, I was looking down the back of the sofa the other night and I found a nickel, it's great. Can't spend it here, it doesn't buy you anything. But a nickel's a nickel, right? Is that what they say? Anyway, I don't even know what a nickel is, I do really. Um, we've got a position, there is one interesting possibility. It depends how fruity Wesley So is feeling. If he really, really wants to go for it, which I don't think he is, because I think it's too risky and a draw isn't going to really damage his tournament that much. After queen h1 check, he could try the move king to e2. Looks really audacious because it allows this move queen to g2 check. The king has to keep on running. We don't like the king here, but it's not so easy to get to. And in this particular position, you can take a pawn off. White still is a piece up, but this king is so precariously placed. Looks as though black's got immense play, and I don't think that's going to happen. I really think this will just end in a repetition. Thank you, Lawrence. I don't... Robert, do you think this is going to be a draw? I definitely do. I think it would be a very audacious attempt, as Lawrence mentioned, to run that king out in the center. And just some sample lines. If the king runs to e2, immediately this pressure. Queen to g2 check. And if king runs to d3... Which is, I mean, you're Hang on, we for just trouble. have a move on the board. What did Wesley play? Wesley has been moving his king back and forth between F2 and F1. So, so he's vying for the draw. He is vying for the draw because he recognized that this would not be a safe bet. Because after king to d3, the move queen takes h3 is possible. The rook on h5 cannot be taken because that leads to checkmate in one. So Wesley, of course, would not play into that. But even instead of g takes h5, it's hard to protect all the pawns. You know, I love these kind of moments. You can see it there on the video. 
both players, they are both realizing, yep, this is probably going to be a draw. One of them is probably thinking, oh crap, I just wasted my opening preparation. The other one's probably thinking, oh, maybe I should have gone for something else. But this is the moment they're probably just about to shake hands and they're thinking about the future of this tournament. Maybe a few regrets. Look at Ramirez there scratching his head. He's probably thinking, oh, maybe I could have gone for more. He's probably thinking, Wesley, look at him there covering his mouth. I'm not sure. I, I just want to know. There he is. He's shaking his head. He's Maybe he's a bit upset with this. What do you think? I think he has to be very happy. He's playing the highest rated player in the tournament, one of the top players in the world, with the black pieces nonetheless. But he looks pretty unhappy. He looks unhappy, but that's because maybe he thought there could be more here. But I, I think he's just recognizing it's a draw and that he's you know shaking his head, not in frustration, but more just to you know, be confident. It's, not, it's just a psychological and there it effect. Is. Shake of hands. There we have. We have draw on board one between the top seed Wesley So from the Philippines and Alejandro Ramirez, looking a bit disappointed. Uh, you know he is disappointed, but he shouldn't be because Wesley defended brilliantly. He did play a nice game. We saw in the opening he looked a little worse, but he fought well to get a, you know, almost an advantage. But Wesley is a very strong player, resourceful defender. There was nothing to be had here. If, if anything, I would say that Wesley might be a bit upset of not utilizing the fact that he has the white pieces in, literally in command today and probably a bit upset he didn't get something more from the opening. But then again, looking at that feedback, Ramirez looks disappointed. I've got to agree, uh, disagree with you, Robert. Perhaps he's thinking now, yes, a draw with Wesley is good, but he probably overestimated his chances. Yeah, maybe he did, but... No, I, I just really, I think he's, you might be right. Uh, Ramirez might be overestimating his position, but I, he shouldn't be. He should, he'll come to realize Look at him there. He is just. No, I know what's happened, guys. Lawrence, what I'm do you think? I'm absolutely certain what's happened. He's, uh, he's realized, dang, it's one o'clock. I just missed the breakfast special downstairs. <laughs> he's thinking, why can't I finish this game a couple of hours earlier? I really fancy some of those pancakes. He doesn't speak like that. He's got a Costa Rican accent, but, you know, you get my drift. Um, he's, uh. He, uh, no, he should be okay. I think he's thinking I missed something, but he'll be glad to know when we see him a bit later, we can see him in the hall and we'll just say, hey. Actually, do you know what? It was a really, really good game. It was uh, an excellent way for him to save the game with Knight takes E3. There was nothing else. We've seen it with the computer. So in a few hours' time, he's going to be happy and he's going to get into the lunchtime special instead. <laughs> well, we are going to have him here with joining us very soon. The very charming Costa Rican grandmaster. Let's see if who's right. Is he disappointed or not? I think he's disappointed, but you know, Robert. You know, I think you're right. <laughs> and it may be he's disappointed that he's not Alex Lenderman. They put the name on the screen, Lenderman. He'd be three and oh if he were Alex Lenderman. So that could be <laughs> the reason why. But he will come in here disappointed and we'll show him oh, that he should be. Oh, and guess what? I just got news we're gonna have Wesley in as well. We're hoping, we're <laughs> hoping for Wesley to come in. So wait for that, guys. But before they come in, let's have a look at some other games. Yeah, definitely. Why don't we uh, check out this game between Timur Gureyev and Georgi Markvillashvili. We haven't checked this game out at all. Timur is one of those crazy players. Like, he is super dynamic. We saw the end of his game yesterday where he had a nice finish. But today, it's an, he's facing an uphill task. Georgie is playing great chess. This pawn on f7 is going to be a target. The knight on d7 doesn't have a great future. And as we've seen time and time again throughout this event, the bishop with the rooks generally outplay the knight. So I think that Timor may survive this game, but he, realistically, he's in trouble. This looks really interesting to me. Let's analyze this position a bit further. How do you think the Georgian can continue here? I'm talking, of course, about Georgi Margvelashvili. Well, he can continue. Well, it, it's Black's move, so Timor can try Knight of Fate. But the problem with Knight of Fate is it simply runs into Rook H8, pinning the Knight to the Rook. It just there's not much that Black can do to get out of this. I mean, it's hard to even suggest a move. This Rook on A7 maybe can slide over to C7, which looks like the logical reply. But from there, it doesn't have much of a future either. You can't move the Rook away from protecting this Knight. So you can even just move this King anywhere maybe to e3 just to take your time that's the key here but maybe it's not winning but the idea to reroute the bishop from e2 to h5 might be in the cards in the near future right that seems like a really interesting plan robert to bring that bishop all the way over to h5 and attack the weakness on f7 but it's surprising to me correct me if i'm wrong that the computer isn't giving such a big plus for white lawrence 
Well, this position reminds me of a typical day you get in London, around about December, maybe late November. It's raining, it's overcast, you get wet on the way home, no sun in sight, nothing to do at night, loneliness. No, sorry, I'm just describing my... I'm joking. No, actually, the position, although it doesn't look so bad for Black, according to the computer, from a practical point of view, he knows he's playing only for a draw at best. There's absolutely no way he's winning this position. He's tied up in not a good way either, I should add. And uh, he's uh, really he's struggling for moves. He's got to shuffle around a bit. He's going to be saying to White, OK, you have to find a way to win this. But you know, I think that according to what I can see on the screen here, there is a way. I'll quickly go over that before we uh, go back to Ariane and Robert. I think the way to do this is to get this bishop not perhaps on this diagonal here, to go here, but to get it on this diagonal. So start off with a move, for example, were black to pass with rook d8, because he can only pass, play the move b3. Bring this guy back here, and then put the king on a square which doesn't lead to check on e5, and then play f5. It's pretty high level thinking, it's a pretty difficult little strategy, but as soon as you do that, I think white will be able to get a winning advantage in this particular game. So I'm going to go with a white win there. Uh, in other news, if we have a look at some of the other big games going on at the moment, of course, we saw a draw on board one, a draw on board two. Other news, back to Ariane. Thank you, Lawrence. Let's have a look at the young upsetter from yesterday who beat Grandmaster Drev, Jeffrey Song. How is he going today? Is he doing any more upsetting? Well, it's a really crazy position. Earlier in the game, we saw that Black had some A pawns that were doubled and not looking so great, but they kind of changed some past pawns over here. The, he just moved his pawn to A3, clearly threatening to break through on the queen side. If pawn takes A3 here, the possibilities go B3, that's one option, trying to get this one into another young lady, or alternatively, after pawn takes A3, the option could be knight C5, a nice intermediate move. And now this rook barrels down on the A file. This rook has great opportunities in the B file. It's looking really good for black, in my opinion. Though I think that white definitely has some chances to hold, and perhaps objectively the position is equal. The stronger players, the black piece is, there is more opportunity for black to win. So the upper side of perhaps an equal position. We have a camera on in the ballroom on their, on So and Ramirez just finished their game outside there talking to some fans I presume we are hoping to get them in here very soon but you know both players they don't look that happy either of them yeah you know I see Wesley so talking to Susan Polgar in that uh, image there it's his coach at Webster University the former women's world champion and you know again Alejandro does look pain you're absolutely right the more I look at the more he looks pain but I believe, they're I, smiling I, right I, now. Well, but. No, I mean, he smiled. They're friends. But yeah. he just really, I guess, thought that he was winning. And, and that's something we've got to remember. You know, these players are really friends outside of, of the chessboard. They get along very, very well. They see each other quite often. It must be quite hard. What is your experience? You know, especially in the U.S., you play uh, pretty much the same players a lot. How do you cope with that friendship battling? It's incredibly diff difficult to play your friends because on the board, you're the most distant enemy. But when you finish your game, you want to go hang out, watch some TV, really have a good time. But yeah. like I said, on the board, you are trying to beat them. You're trying your best to crush their skull. And that's what Alejandro Ramirez is clearly doing. He looked pain, and you know he tried his best, but it was an even battle. That's right. Well, we're going to get set up here with the top seed, but let's go to Lawrence first. Oh. The things are falling down. It's all right. I can still see just about. I don't know what Alejandro is so upset about. If I could grow a fro like that, I would. I'd get that stuff permed and put some shampoo in it and some leave-in conditioner. I'd love to be able to grow a fro like that. I'd get it braided for special occasions. What's he so upset about? He just drew with black against Wesley So as well. Oh, I'd like that result. Wesley, if we ever do play, if you can hear me, I would like a draw with black just to... Just to let you know. No, I think uh, when he comes in, uh, which he might do, I'm not sure if it's just Wesley coming here, he will realize, and we'll just go to the game, that he actually played really well. There was no chance for him to uh, convert. Uh, Wesley found a very important move, G4, in basically the final position before the repetition. Before then, 
there wasn't that much going on, and I think uh, we'll be looking at this game a bit more in depth in a moment. In the meantime, just a quick update on some other results and some other games in progress. Well, on board, I believe it's board four, this game here with Conrad Holt and Yu Yang Yi, we've had a major transformation. Amazingly, all of the pieces have come off. It was so complicated before. Now there's just queen and knight versus queen and bishop, equal amount of pawns, and basically this is a pretty equal position. All black needs to do is make sure that this queen and knight don't end up menacing along these weak squares here. I think a good way for black to go would just to be to give a load of checks. Check here. He can even play the move bishop d6 now just to deprive the king coming out. And just keep on checking. Check, 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 check. I like checks. Please send me a large one. Back to Ariane. We are here with a very special guest. My personal favorite for the tournament, Philippine-born Grandmaster Wesley So. Wesley, were you expecting more with the white pieces today, or are you satisfied with your draw? Oh, well, of course, I can, can be satisfied with um, getting draws with the white pieces, such an early pace of the tournament. Um, but as, as Lauren said, I didn't have much chances for today, so I'll have to be more ambitious for the next few rounds. Right, so would you say that you weren't exactly satisfied with your preparation? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, with two games a day, and just uh, like we love games every day and just some relative bit time, relatively little time to prepare for each opponent. I uh, didn't have much preparation for today. <laughs> well, now you've got a bit of a break before the next round. Robert, let's talk about the game. Yeah, Wesley, in the position up here, did you expect this knight sacrifice coming with knight takes e queen h2 check? Uh, King of one, knight takes e3. Did you see this going into it? Yeah, for, unfortunately, it's all, everything is all forced. He has to take on e3, and here he uh, played a really good move, rook e8. At first, he was uh, intending to play g6, which is not as good because of g4. So it's the same idea as in the game, yeah. but what, what's the difference here? But uh, as you can see, the pawn on e3 is not under pressure, and if he gives a check on h1, I can run to e2 and then go run over to the queen side, which was not possible during during the game because he has he had too many pawns. Yeah, he looked upset after the game. Did he think that he was winning? Um, I don't know. He probably, he's probably just always upset. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I didn't think both of us had many uh, great chances during the game. And uh, when he played e5, I didn't see any any anything anything special for white. Um, this idea a3 before for for white doesn't seem to give too much. Was that just because, like you said, there's a lot of time, two games a day, you don't have time to prepare? Is that you just played something that you thought would be a good mm -hmm. strategy, a slow game, and try to grind it out, or something you played before? I haven't played this before. I was uh, hoping I would get something out of the opening, but unfortunately not this time. I'm thinking here instead of queen c2, maybe I should have gone instead for uh, bishop e2. It might be a, a better try since E6, E5 would come with less force because the queen puts pressure on the D5 pawn in, indirectly. I now, have a question for Wesley before I forget. Slightly off topic. You just turned 21, Wesley, is that right? Yesterday. So, <laughs> have you, I mean, if I was in Vegas and I was 21, the first thing I'd do is say, you know, let's go downstairs, put 100 on black. Did you do that? Put 100 on blackjack? <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100 on black on the roulette, 100 mm -hmm. on. I don't know anything. Just because now you're, you know, you're in Vegas and you can you can put a bet on. Yeah, I'm glad to be in Vegas. There are a lot of uh, nice people. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of uh, nice and there friendly are a lot, people. There are a lot of nice people in Vegas. Wait, okay. Yeah. What you're did you do for your twenty first birthday, Wesley? Well, I had two games yesterday, so uh, not much. But uh, we we went out and uh, we had this really fantastic meal in a on a great restaurant. So yeah, yeah. You're having fun. Yeah, I am. I'm glad to be in Vegas. It's more. It's more exciting to spend your, your birthday here. Yeah. Right. You know, I have just one last question before you go. Yeah. You have recently, well, not recently, but you, you've moved, you're fresh in the U.S. How is that affecting your chess? Well, I haven't, uh, well, as I, I feel, I'm trying to switch federations, so I'm still waiting for uh, some time. And... Um, 
But what I'm, about living in America, yeah. like as a student and in St. Louis, how is that, is that affecting your test in a good way, in a bad way, how is it? I would say in a good way. Yeah? Because uh, I moved two and a half years ago. Yeah. And I moved to Webster University where we have 11 grandmasters living. Right. And so I, it's a fresh experience for me. I have a lot of strong players willing to work with me. Mm -hmm. And compared to the Philippines, there are a lot more stronger players here. So I'm hoping in the future I could work with players like Karna Kamor and Alex Anistuk and the new guys. Yeah. Or, you know, you might even be competing for their top place as in the strongest American players, who knows? <laughs> I wish you all the best of luck for the next few rounds and definitely get some rest and prepare well for round four. Good luck, Wesley. Yeah, yeah. yeah good luck, Wesley. And if you want to hit up the blackjack tables after the round, let me know. Uh, we can play with your money, of course. Uh, I never win at blackjack. Silly game. Uh, in other news, we have got a position in the game between Naya uh, and Barcenella, uh, who is also, uh, well, these guys are on one and a half. They're still on our feature boards. We can see the position after Knight F6 check. Actually, Naya is just winning this one, hands down. I believe we had, uh, actually, there are no more moves after this, but Naya is just going to win. He's an exchange up. It is that easy. So that will be a win for the Russian Grandmaster. means he's back in contention. In the other top boards, we've got... Still no result between Conrad Hole in the game between Mamadov and Brunello. We can see that Brunello is still a pawn up. A pawn is a pawn. He is grinding away, a bit like a lot of these poker players. He's going to be doing it for a while. He doesn't have to rush. Slow, slow grinding. And he's got all the chances. He's playing for two results. So we're going to have to keep an eye on that one. Mamadov in a lot of trouble, needs to find a saving mechanism. In the game between Sadora and Matamoros, this was really exciting. It's got even crazier, but you know what? I have faith in Carlos. He's a veteran, he's been around the block, he found this great idea with queen e2 and then the queen back to h5, and if we look at the current position, he's just about got everything defended and is a piece up. So I'm gonna go for a black win there, much to the disappointment of uh, our Ariane, but C'est la vie, as they say in various parts of France and Northern Africa. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. We are here with Grandmaster Alejandro Ramirez. Now, we were having a bit of a debate earlier before you came in. I was saying that you looked very disappointed with your jaw, probably hoping for something more. And Robert here thinks you're satisfied. Tell us the truth. Actually, it's a little bit of both. I, was, I felt that before the game, a draw would be perfect. I'm playing one of the top players in the world. I thought a draw with black would be a great result. But the way that he played the opening, I thought was very suspicious. And I thought at some point, I must have had something. And I just tanked. I used a lot of time. And I kept trying to find these resources, and I just couldn't do it. I didn't see anything better than the game continuation, which eventually led to a draw. And I thought that was OK. But I felt that at some point, I misplayed the position myself. Well, you're saying that he probably a bit of a dubious opening preparation. He, we just had him in, in earlier, and he also said, you know, he wasn't that satisfied with the white pieces. Robert, what do you think about any decisions Black could have made earlier on that Wesley pointed to? Perhaps he could have played. Yeah, I mean, Wesley was in here saying that he didn't have much time to prepare with the double round for, as you well know, playing in the United States for a long time. But he thought that you played excellently, that you kind of minim minimalized his advantage. And from there, we got this position on the board. And that's kind of the position we started talking to Wesley about. Um, when you, you were here, I was saying to Lawrence that you would find this knight sacrifice because it was your only option. What, I mean, w when you got to the ensuing position with knight takes e3, pawn takes, and rook e8, how were you feeling? Well, at this point, I had 15 minutes left. So that actually uh, made me a little nervous because when I thought about it, I had 15 minutes left, and I forgot that this is not increment. So this was a hard 15 minutes, and this was very different than 15 minutes with 30 second increment, which is what I'm used to. Uh, that being said, the position is extremely complicated, and I was playing somewhat by analyzing and somewhat by instinct, because it just felt to me that white couldn't possibly have that big of an advantage in any variation with the knight on a4 so far away from the attack that black has going on. And even if there's nothing decisive, I might be able to get an extra pawn from what I already have and keep some kind of pressure. I didn't feel like I could possibly be worse. 
Yeah, and you definitely weren't worse here, but actually what we were suggesting in the commentary was that white has two options to hold uh, the equality. One was this move knight to b6, which he didn't play, uh, and after, because knight to b6, after g6, knight he is. runs his knight into d7. Yeah, I saw this variation, of course, during the game. I thought that this was one of his possibilities, and I thought, okay, the end game should be no problem for black uh, after rook f5 and you trade everything. So I thought, I saw this during the game, and I thought this wasn't going to be much of an issue. And I didn't realize that he already only had two options for equality. I thought that at some point he might have something to at least continue the game in an unclear position, not necessarily that he was worse than everything else. But of course, this endgame I thought, okay, how can black be worse here? Right, and black isn't worse. So that begs the question, what is the source of your, dis you know, your disappointment? Because we couldn't find anything for you besides this uh, petering out to an equal position or the three-time repetitions in the game. Maybe it's a combination of that feeling that you are attacking <laughs> and you want more from the position. And maybe the other half is that earlier there was something going on. Maybe I think that before I played, mm, maybe instead of bishop g4, I should have gone queen d6 was an interesting idea to just keep a little bit more of pressure. I don't know. I feel like his opening was just so sketchy that I think I must have had a way of putting a little bit more of pressure. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's the worst thing in chess when you feel like something could have happened and it didn't. But in the end, it was a well-played game. Yes, definitely. Probably disappointing, but also in, it's a good thing. You, you drew with the top seed. It's only the third round. You've got a long way to go. How are you going to prepare for the next game? I know you can't prepare chess-wise too much because it's two rounds a day. You're going to have a rest now? Yeah. Luckily, although it was a tough game, it didn't last that long in terms of hours. So we didn't go into the second time control. So I have some time to have lunch, maybe relax a little bit. So well, Lawrence thinks that up. you are going to go for some lunch buffet or something. Throw okay. some dice. Uh, I'll try to do that at night. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> Don't gamble too much while here. Good luck for the rest of the tournament. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are going to go to a 10-minute break. There is going to be a puzzle up on the screen. Guess the winning move. See you in 10 minutes.
are back at the Millionaire Chess Open, you'll notice that we're nearing the end of round three as some of the tables are now empty. But before we get back into those final games, let's have a look at the solution to guess the winning move with Lawrence. Yes, I remember 1867 Paris. I was having a coffee, some cheese. So, <laughs> my French accent's terrible. You've got to get a proper comedian up here. No, Sam Lloyd versus Sam Rosenthal. Um, amazing little position. It's amazing that chess, you know, is not only uh, beautiful nowadays, but it's been beautiful for over hundreds, two hundred. It's such a, it's such a beautiful old game which has got a long future, in my opinion. And we've got a position here over 150 years ago. White to play and win. Did you solve it? I hope you did because it's a beautiful little puzzle. White in this position plays the move queen takes f3. Unbelievable little idea, sacrificing the queen. The point is that once the queen takes the other queen, now this gives this square for the knight to go knight d7 check. The king has to come in the corner, and now the pièce de résistance, as the French would say, the final nail in the coffin. The knight now comes to c6 with check. There's only one way to block that, that's knight to a6, and now the beautiful little switch back with the knight, knight to b6, those knights are doing the tango around the king, that's checkmate. When a knight attacks the king, uh, you can't block it, you can only take that piece, and here, those two knights, well, they're covering all the squares. Beautiful little puzzle there, Lloyd Rosenthal, Paris, 1867. Um, Back to Ariane. You, were, you, were, you weren't around in those times. You were I, far, was, I wasn't around. You were around, far too young. But little miniatures like that prove that chess is an eternal game, always full of fantasy, imagination, creativity, and calculation. Speaking of calculation, we have a very, very good young calculator here, Jeffrey Xiong, who is about to score his next upset. Looks like he's completely winning this one. Yeah, it, he just is steamrolling his opposition. Earlier in the game, it was really unclear, but now if we look at the position, he's this nice pass pawn in C7. And that pawn is very happy keeping the rooks at bay on the, the last rank. However, it's not quite so clear. The starting move, rook h8 check, looks like a good option for black. Because if the king has force to go to g2, the rook no longer attacks his pawn on g5. Instead, a preferable option is probably rook h3, but at the same time, that loosens the defense in this a3 pawn. So perhaps uh, with the move, maybe king, I can't even, can't, can't even find these moves. Rook h3 check, king takes, and perhaps a move like knight to e4, but this pawn on c7 is too much. And Look I think that, how relaxed this guy is. Yeah, he's in got this some kind of swagger. Position. He's got he's swagger. He's got his little hoodie on. He's walking around. He's just about to beat up his next grandmaster. Although, as you just said, it's not that easy. So hopefully the young Jeffrey Xiong doesn't get too overconfident. There must be a lot of expectation on his shoulders now, in his mind at least, you know, thinking, I'm going to score the next upset. Ever been in that situation, Robert? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're always on the lookout for the upset, but you can't be overconfident. When you know you have the advantage, and as the younger player, the less experienced player, you got to really keep your nerves together. And here, it's still not the end of the game because a move like pawn takes a three is possible, where you know you both sides are concerned about the promotion, but still, Jeffries Young has the edge. I think, well, we think that he is pulling through and going to beat his second straight grandmaster. That's right, but hopefully he doesn't walk around a bit too much because we don't want him getting overconfident and losing that big upset, Lawrence. Well, this kid is one to watch out for. We've had, uh, in recent years, I say we, what I really mean to say is you guys here have had a bit of a renaissance when it comes to chess in the US. You've got this new generation of grandmasters, the likes of our own Mr. Hess, Naraditsky, Conrad Holt, Ray Robson, the list goes on. And this kid, he's already an IM, world junior champion. He's looking to take out his He's a second grandmaster opponent, and in fact, B takes E3 has just been played, but it's all but over now. It's absolutely finished, and I'm sure that Jeffrey is going to find the following combination. Let's have a look. We've got him there. He's in his hoodie. He's a bit surprised, I think, at B takes A3. The point is that now you can play Rook takes G5 check, and you have an attack on the knight, so you win the knight now. If the king moves, let's say it goes to F6, you can take this knight off, and 
black is banking on this move A2 to try and promote the pawn down there. However, and this is a big however, it's a really simple task for white to now just take this pawn off with check on F4. The king has to go either to the E file or the G file, doesn't really matter. If it comes to the G file, you give another check, let's say the king goes over one more file, and now you just drop the rook back, controlling this square. Yes, black can still promote the, court, the pawn because the rook is behind, but after pawn equals queen, you just whip that guy off, rook takes, and now the knight comes into D6, and that's all she wrote. That is it. It's game over. Black can resign with a clear conscience. And I'm absolutely sure that young Jeffrey Zhang is going to see that somebody of his ability, tactical ability, it's not difficult at all. And he's going to win the game. Yes, that's him right there. Jeffrey Zhang, international master. He's only 14 years old, youth, world youth chess champion. That guy has a bright future ahead of him. Yeah, definitely. He's an incredibly strong player, up-and-coming talent in the United States. Hopefully we'll see him soon in the United States Chess Championship, but right now all he's thinking about is show me the money. Give me that Vegas $100,000 purse. I want it. He's wearing the hoodie. He's confident. Let's see him get it. And you know, I don't even think it's about the money for this guy. He's probably vying for his GM norm. D does anyone know? Have he, has he got any GM norms in his bag yet? Yeah, he's at least one, and he's going to become a grandmaster soon regardless. But you know, you say the $100,000 doesn't matter. I, th I think it matters. <laughs> he's, uh, he's sitting there really calm. I think a bigger smile would be on his face if he can bring home that purse. Yeah, he looks totally focused, totally ready to bring home this point. Let's go to a game that is just being crazy. It's been up and down like a roller coaster. Armenian-born American Grandmaster Varuj Jakobian. Let's have a look at this crazy game. Yeah, we're going to go backwards in time because this was once the position on the board. And the best move for white was knight takes c5. It looks a little bit strange because you're putting your knight on free from this bishop. The rook's already under attack. But this bishop is overloaded. The pawn on h6 needs to be defended or else queen takes would be checkmate. So after this move, uh, g4, hit rook f6, which also looks quite strong, attacking the knight on d6. But he missed black's plan. Queen e7, excellent move. Now it looks like a free knight. Rook takes d6. White is up a piece. Here comes the tactical blow of the tournament. Queen takes f7. That is fantastic stuff. That's that, amazing. That is an unbelievable move by the young Chinese player. And what happens if rook takes queen? It looks like he gets the queen. However, rook a takes f7, and there's no stopping checkmate. The game would be over despite white being up a queen. The rooks barrel down the f file, coming to f1, putting that king entrapped in the corner, game over. But instead, the, the fight raged on. And instead of taking that queen, he made this move after queen takes f7, rook ff6, looking like it's protected here. But not to be deterred, bishop to g5, keeping that queen on pre. The game exploded quickly with knight takes c5. Queen takes f6, giving this queen up. It means nothing to him to have the royal lady. He does not need the monarch. And after finally losing the queen, he made a huge mistake coming up. It's, he shouldn't have given up the queen. He here should have went bishop takes f6, taken the rook, achieved victory, but now it's all over. Instead, he took with the queen, and now it's from here it's going to be smooth sailing for Mr. Kobian because his king is now saved in 94, and he's going to win the game. Looks like we're not the only ones excited about this position. Lawrence? I can't believe it. This, pos this game has had more blunders than a George Bush acceptance speech. Is he quite <laughs> oh, apologies for that. He's, still, he's not present anyway. It's all right. I'm only kidding. I'm English. I get away with it. No, but it's seri on a serious note, Wang Yung Yao, it's amazing that he didn't play, for me, a move just around here. If we go back, it was around this point. Knight takes c5. Why isn't he playing bishop takes rook here, Robert? He just wins a whole rook. If you take on h6, so what? You go king g8, you play queen g7 next move. There's still the back rank threats. Sorry, am I going mad? Maybe it's me. I I've only had one cup of tea this morning, so I can't tell. But uh, just bishop takes f6, and he's going to win the game. Am I going mad here, Robert? Well, no, it's what we talked about earlier, that youthful exuberance. Trying to really be ambitious to pull home the point. He was going, or trying to go, I should say, in fine style. And it backfired horribly. He's now in a lost position. What could have been his second big upset in a row is going to turn into a defeat. So despite the 2-0 start, this loss brings him back down to earth. And he'll be quite disappointed to not bring this one in. 
Yeah, unfortunately that's what happens. You, you do an upset and then you crash and burn. You get too excited, maybe a bit too emotional, overestimating your chances. But Burrush is just a, just a hard guy to crack. I mean, he's very solid and he's in it to win it. Yeah, this definitely. Tournament. He's trying to look at him right here. He's serious. He's concentrated. He knows that now is the time to pounce. And he's going to win this game. And he's going to feel pretty lucky. And when luck is on your side, sometimes that's more important than the good moves. If you can just get through the tournament unscathed and make it to Millionaire Monday, he'll be an extre extremely happy camper. That's right. Millionaire Monday is what it's all about. That's what these guys are playing for. There's big money in this. We're nearing the towards the end of the round. Robert, are any other games that we can find catch up in their final moments? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we've been looking at the Zhang game. That should be over relatively soon. But a lot of the other games have finished. But here's one that we looked at earlier. And the dynamic has changed quite a bit. We see that on the board, uh, white has taken the pawn on b6. So the material is even. However, if we look at the piece play, this knight on g8 has zero moves. There are doubled pawns here that are weak. The pawn on a5 will eventually be lost. The white king can even start by going king to f4 and taking the pawn on f5 next move. So hope is low. Look at Timur Gray. He's, <laughs> you know, he's looking out. He's holding his. That guy hair is in his crazy. Hand. Look at his hair. His lifestyle. He's he loves challenges. You know, I've heard some stories about this guy. He loves life. He's so passionate about everything. But in this position, not much to be passionate about. He may about. be well dressed, <laughs> but his game is not uh, matching up to the suit that he's wearing. So unfortunately for him, he's going down in flames. And you know, he's one of the top players. He was. He's you know, staring out into space. Look at that. I mean, he, he's hopeless. I'm just wondering how much He's thinking, what am I doing here, suffering for two hours? I'm just going to go downstairs and make a full... Hey, he might even make the 100,000 downstairs. I think his he... mind is already somewhere else. Yeah, what's catching his attention there? I'm not sure. He's, he's hungry. What's he looking at? <laughs> he's a bit hungry there. I'm dreaming. Of, you know, I don't know what he's dreaming of. You know, I can't sing either, so I'll stop. He's, he's just trying not to lose, and he's going down. So it's, it's, yeah. all, it's terrible for him. He's looking at the camera a little tell bit. You one, I'll tell you one thing. He shouldn't play poker. Because that's a giveaway. <laughs> oh no! My Her busted draw! He is originally from Uzbekistan, is that right? That is right. He uh, transferred to the United States. He's been a competitor in the U.S., playing in the U.S. championships the last two years. And he's a fierce competitor. But if you look at the odds, they're 99% opportunity for White to win. And that is absolutely going to happen. And I think he's having a bit of a go at his opponent. Look at him. He's just <laughs> laughing there. He's sitting there totally smug. Look at his face. He's like, oh, just shake my hand. This is over. Give me a break. Look at him. Yeah, he's, he knows it's over. He's, look, he's sweating a little bit, uh, massaging his head. It, it's done. <laughs> it's really over. He's, he's upset, but uh, the show will go on, and he can bounce back next He round. even looks a bit embarrassed, doesn't he? <laughs> nah, he's tired. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll be okay. <laughs> well, what about some other games we have on these top boards here? Um, well, it looks like most of the games are coming to a close, or if they've come to a close already. Ray Robson, he won his game. Uh, earlier in the game, it looked quite shaky, but he came in on top. As we see in this final position, black only has four pawns to white's five. This B pawn is going to be unstoppable. This pawn on D6 is under attack. So Ray Robson coming through. He had a very shaky game yesterday. He almost lost. Today, again, a shaky position in the early going, but you know he is really a tough competitor. I played him a bunch of times. He's fierce. He's fearless. He loves the game, and you know he's up at two and a half out of three now. Yeah. So how many players now have we got on, well, verging on three out of three? It was originally 21 at the start of this round, 21 players on three out, on two out of two, sorry. Yeah. So now how many have we got on a perfect score? Well, we don't have that many. Alex Lenderman came through with an early victory, so that puts him at three out of three. Other than him, you know, the top boards finished pretty much all in draws. We had Wesley So uh, held to a draw by Alejandro Ramirez. We also had uh, Sam Shanklin held to a draw by the strong Estonian Grandmaster. Um, the other games that were drawn were uh, Bu Zhangji finally held to that half point. All games for him seemed to be going that path, but finally it caught up to him and he was held to a draw. But you know, perhaps going forward, we still have some of these games going. Decisive uh, matches can ensue. And if that's the case, Alex Lennerman will be joined by other competitors. Now, I'd like to remind everybody, while Robert looks for some other games to look at, that tonight, come back, 8 p.m. Pacific time, we will be here commenting on round four of the Millionaire Chess Open. It's going to be exciting, so make sure to book that in your diary tonight at 8 p.m. Robert, what are we looking at?
Well, your good friend Julio Sedora actually Eno, went down in flames. Eno Sedora. Eno Sedora went down in flames. <laughs> Carlos Matamoros, as Lawrence was suggesting earlier, held strong. And in the end, the extra piece was enough. We see that Black's bishop on d7 prevents the d5 and d6 pawns from uh, promoting. And from there, it's easy. There's three pawns for Black on the king side. A simple, you know, rook c7 is easily parried off by, well, one, rook c8 trades the rooks immediately. And once that happens, it's game over. So there are no options for Sedora here. He tipped his king over. He resigned. He's, you know, he's, he, is he out of the tournament? What do you think? I don't think he's out of the tournament. Eno is a fighter, and he's going to come back. That Filipino fighting spirit is going to get him somewhere. But, you know, this was far too an interesting game. Let's go back a few moves because last time we had a look at this, White had some control. He sacked a piece for the C4 pawn. And then just things went crazy. Walk us through what happened. Well, here, a Black was already up the bishop, but an attack was mounting. However, White misplayed along the way. As we can see, he was moves king a1, which looks a little obscure, but prevents any checks on this g6 to b1 diagonal. From there, Black kind of consolidated his pieces, bishop b7, finally getting it out of there. And queen d4, if that's your best move, your position isn't that great. And so, Madame Moore is the strong Ecuadorian grandmaster. Just look at that, offering the trade of pieces. When you're up material, you like to trade. But you have to go back. But now all the pieces are going backwards, not bode, does not bode well for white. But then there was a little bit of repetition here. And after knight e4, he said, knight b6, but white, way too optimistic, went for f4. Wow. Knight d6 would have uh, claimed to draw. Instead, he tried to win. So to his credit, he went for it. Yeah. He went for that risk. You got to risk it to get the biscuit. And he tried but he failed miserably. Uh, that, that's some of the sadness of playing chess. You know, you take that risk, and it's at that critical moment you go, as we just saw, you know, could have had a draw with the strong grandmaster and, and went into the next round with, with a solid draw. But no, he decided to take the risk, and it didn't give him any reward, but that's chess, and that's life. You've got to take a risk to try and get somewhere, get something. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for him. He sacked the bishop early on, getting rid of the c4 pawn, but he just couldn't keep his initiative. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's, life will go on. Now Alex Lenderman may be paired against this strong player, but we'll see going forward. We haven't talked about Matamoros very much. He's kind of gone under the radar, but now he'll be on our minds because he will be continuing to be on those top boards, competing, continuing his undefeated path towards the $100,000 purse. That's right, and talk about undefeated and young and dangerous. Have a look at the crowd around this young guy here. He is just going for it. Did he play that variation, Lawrence, he, that we were talking about? Yeah, he did. And you can see him there on the screen. He's going like that. He's thinking, my goodness, how many cheeseburgers can I get with $100,000? He's probably not thinking that, but he's thinking, why is this guy playing on, you know? Does he know who I am? 12, 13, 14 years old, world junior champion. He needs to have a bit more respect for me. Uh, the truth is, he's just totally winning, and I know he's worked it out. He's good. He played the variation. He played with rook takes c5. We can see on the screen. He's going to mop that pawn up easy on f4. Thank you very much. He's going to then retreat back the rook back. And Jal, this is a bit of posturing, you know. It's uh, we see it a lot downstairs in the poker room. Oh, I don't know whether I should fold. I've got nothing. Basically, it's the same position here. Jal knows he's busted, and Zhong is going to take home the full point to be the sensational story of the tournament so far. Yeah, this is this is going to be a bit of a, a blow to Zhang Xiao Zhao. He previously was a second to our second seed, Bu Shangji, and you'd think working with him, you know, he's definitely a very very solid player. And probably very disappointed now. You can look, see him now on the video losing to this kid. Probably not too happily, ho happy. Hopefully his boss is a little bit more happy. How did Boo play today? Well, Boo had a draw we saw a little bit earlier. It was not the most interesting game. It petered out very, very quickly. And if we scroll to that one, you know, it kind of happens. Sometimes you're playing a strong player. They have white. They're going to make sure the position is level as possible. But you know, back to Jeffrey Zhang for a second. If we want to talk about him, it's just unbelievable what he's doing. His confidence is at an all-time high. He's not swayed by the pressure of this tournament. And you know, as a grandmaster, sometimes you get to play a lower-rated player, an international master, but it's always tricky when they're young because they're growing players. And Zhao should have been happy with his pairing coming into this round. Sometimes you're paired with other strong grandmasters, which is sometimes an uncomfortable pairing. But here, he really just got outplayed. And 
all to Jeffrey's credit. Yeah, uh, you can see the, the crowd just looking on at this wonderkind. And he look at Zhao, he's just sitting there thinking, this is over. Lawrence. I've got to dive in there. I disagree with Robert. I think if I see I'm playing uh, a young guy, 14 years old, world champion, yeah, he might not be a grandmaster, but that's our worst nightmare, right? Now that we're veterans, well, I say we, Robert, you're not quite, but that's the last thing I want, some fresh kid who didn't go out last night, doesn't know what bourbon is, etc., etc. You know, that's, that's, that's my worst nightmare. Um, and Zhao's thinking, oh, goodness me, it's happening. He knows he's busted. He's just posturing, really. He's looking at a few variations to see if there's any way to salvage this. But there's just no way. It's just completely game over. And I feel for him, but I'm absolutely thrilled to see one of uh, another uh, of America's brilliant products come through. And he'll be going to three out of three. Yes, Robert. Let's take us to a few other games that are nearly finishing up this very exciting round three of the Millionaire Chess Open. What have we got? Yeah, why don't we go back to Young EU versus Conrad Hall. We haven't been there in a while. Earlier the game was, you know, both sides had good chances, but now it looks like White is doing so much better than he was earlier. Uh, the last move was Bishop D6. If we see Black's King has zero moves, which means that if this Queen can get to the back rank and provide a check, that could be game over. However, the king on f5 also is in grave danger. If white starts this move knight e6, cutting off the black queen on e1 from this e8 square for checkmate, and threatening pawn to g7 with another checkmate, queen to e5 might be possible with very good chance of perpetual check. And it looks like it's backed up by the computer, 50-50. It means that with best play, it'll likely ensue a perpetual check leading to a draw. Robert. Actually, to pop in there, 96 is a losing move, Robert. It's unbelievable. Just to point that out, it says 50 50 based on the current position. But if he plays 96, this Queen E5 check is game over for White. Let me explain why. 96, Queen E5. The King has to come to G4 only move. And now you just go Queen back to E2. And the King hasn't really got any good squares. Because if it comes to F5, whoops, Queen F3, that will pick up the Knight minimum. There's no way to block the check. So that would win on the spot. And if it goes elsewhere, let's say it goes to h4, you just start mopping up pawns. And now you come to g3. And the same thing happens. You can't come to h5 because of checkmate here. And if you go back to f5, we see the same thing. So 96 is actually totally impossible in this position. The way white should play, but it's really tricky for Conrad, is to play the move queen e6. I think that's the only saving move. If he plays 96, heartbreak, because queen e5 is so easy to see. I think this is an extremely interesting position, guys. Let's let's go with that. Queen e6. Yeah, queen e6 looks like the only move then because we're trying to stop that check on e5. And after queen e6, perhaps the best plan for black is to continue queen f2 check. You have to protect the knight on d4 because king g4. Oh, split. here we go. I think he just played queen e6, did he? he? he did he play queen e6? He, he probably did because it looks like the only move. Um, yep, queen e6 was mm -hmm. played on the board. So we have this position. And after queen f2 check, king back to e4, I would imagine after queen to e1 check, you can sign the score sheets because king d3. You think they're going to go for repetition? Oh, absolutely. Because it doesn't look like this king has many places to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, the queen could come anywhere with a bazillion checks. So I think the repetition will ensue. And But black does have to be careful not to you know, try to do anything too dangerous because his back rank is very vulnerable. Very vulnerable indeed. He can't really have a waiting move here because it's mate in one with the queen on e8, queen on c8, there's all sorts of threats there. Wow, this is exciting. This is an exciting game. And unfortunately, going to peter out to a draw, but that's chess, you know? You play a few exciting moves, both sides play accurately, and there's nothing you can do. Lawrence. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's sometimes what happens. Uh, you know, you play the best moves, it ends in a draw. We've got a shot here. I'm sorry, Lawrence. I have to interrupt Cut you. Cut me off whenever you want. It's fine. Delete me off Facebook, whatever you like. You can block me, I don't mind. You know I won't what? take it offensively. We just got too, way fine. too excited here. We thought that the young, Jewish, I can't pronounce his name, the young guy, young American prodigy, world junior chess champion, just won, and he's about to win. But go on, Lawrence. He's what? about to shake hands. I when he know. does, Is I'll he? interrupt you again. Can he even reach that far? I mean, he, he looks <laughs> quite, I mean, he's, a, he's quite, he's concentrated. I love it because, you know, 
one big mistake that juniors make is that they get a bit excited and they make a mistake at the final hurdle. But he, you don't get to world junior champion without having that little X factor. He clearly has got it. He's already rated 2470, 14 years old. That's really heartbreaking for me. I mean, I'm just devastated at that. Why couldn't have I been that good? I wouldn't have to do this and make bad jokes. I could be there winning <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I'm, I'm a bit upset. I don't think I can carry on. Back to you, Ariel. <laughs> Lawrence, I think you're quite good as a comedian. I think that should have been your career choice. But we love having you here at the Millionaire Chess Open. I love being here. <laughs> certainly, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else except downstairs. Certainly one of our most loved commentators. Playing a bit of blackjack. <laughs> Sorry, back to you. <laughs> certainly one of the most loved commentators in the chess world. What a clown he is, you know. Just a great commentator <laughs> over there, always cracking the jokes. We love it here. It makes our life a lot easier. We are happy. That's right, he does bring that I wish they were just as colorful as your tie, though, Robert. <laughs> I've been waiting for the tie joke yeah. all round. I, know. I wore it just for you, Lawrence. Guys, score let's sheets go are look at the Akobian game. It's over. The dreams are, are over for a Yung Wall Wan who can't score his next upset. Well, I would say the dreams are over, but he should be really disappointed with his game here. Akobian very, should be very happy to He's get through. He's very happy. He looks you know, kind of calm because he knows. He knows that at one point he was in trouble. If we look at the game from where we last ch uh, checked off, we had a position similar to this. And the problem was that this knight on e4 covered all checkmate attempts. And right now, rook g1 checkmate in the position that I have on the screen, um, if we could put that up, uh, that he's threatening checkmate in one. The issue is knight f6 check. Only move, powerful move, forcing the issue. Rook takes f6, but after queen takes e3, no longer is rook f2 check a threat because now white can just take off all the pieces and when you're up two pawns in the center, you're gonna win the game. So unfortunately for him, very quickly ended in, in his loss for black. Bishop e4, fantastic. Uh, fa well, bishop e4 does not look like a good move. So if, unless this is mistaken, there's a checkmate that should have been played. So there may be a relay error because that would have ended the game immediately. But um, barring that, uh, relay error, I think that it looks like Kobin just steamrolled his pawns down the center, allowing him to win the game. Yes, Robert, this looks like the classic case of wanting to get more than you deserve, getting a bit excited. Lawrence. Yeah, absolutely. It must have been a relay error there. Uh, Kobin has taken the point. But uh, I just really would love to go back to this Zhong game because we see that Zhao is trying his hardest to salvage this. How will his nerves hold up the young American player. We've got a check here on g8, and he's moved his king to h3. That is a very good move. And the point is that if the rook now comes back to h8 to give a check, he just keeps on sliding and slithering that king up the board, now goes to g4, and any check again, well, that can be met by king takes f4, and there are no more checks, and that's pretty much it. So a great move, king h3. According to the computer, he's already plus five, and what that means is he is equivalent of five pawns up, which, in terms of a material deficit, is insuperable. I've completely missed the accent on how to say that. I just can't say it in English. I can say it in Spanish. So, yeah, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Young is going to win this one, I'm pretty sure. And look at the time difference there. He's got double the time, almost. Oh, here we go. we got to move. Rook f4. A2. Yeah, A2, Rook f4. He's very confident. He knows that he's winning this game, and he should be. And like you said, the time advantage kind of shows that throughout the game. Is that the seconds? It looks like black only has six seconds left. Oh, that wasn't minutes. Look yeah. at that. That is a huge time difference. So uh, this game is over probably in six seconds. So as soon as he <laughs> hits that clock, uh, maybe his time will run out and the game will be decided that way, but a great showing. And as Lawrence pointed out earlier, all he has to do now is to give a check and go back to the first rank and cover that A2 pawn. Lawrence. It's a bit trickier than that. I know I've tried to trivialize it. It's a bit tricky because he's played a certain way here. He's played A2. Let me just explain how you're supposed to win this one. It's actually all about giving a few checks. The, the rooks and the knight work really well together. The knight does a great job in certain positions of protecting both rooks and giving check. Let me explain. Rook takes pawn check. The king now has a few squares to go to. Let's say it goes to E6. 
you give another check here on e4. Let's say it goes back to f6. Now you give another check with this rook. And the point is, the king comes to f5 here. Now you've got this move knight d6. This is the move I was trying to explain before. You give a check and protect the rook. The king comes back to f6. And now the complete knockout blow, which is tr tough to see, but he might see it, is the move knight to e8 double check. Pretty amazing move. And the point is that if he comes back, you can play pawn equals queen. I beg your pardon. Am I, am I making a hash of this? Yes, I am. I can't even get off here. Let's make that a queen. Is this winning? Am I going crazy? Knight d6. No, this is winning. Knight d6, check. It's very complicated because you take the knight back with rook. Anyway, I'm complicating things, and it's really very difficult to explain very quickly, but uh, just trust me, it's winning. Um, <laughs> the question is whether he'll see it. Let's see how he progresses. Well, we trust you, Lawrence, and even more so, we trust the fact that his opponent only has, a, what, six seconds left. So I'm pretty sure young Jeffrey is going to win this one. Oh, it's made in nine. It's made it's, in nine. It's <laughs> force go. checkmate in nine moves. He just played king e7, which is the worst move on the board. Great news for Jeffrey. All he has to do is find a very forcing rook sequence, and that's it, Robert. Well, yeah, I mean, if he finds that rook sequence, it'll be over. But I'm going to take us to a different game for a moment here. We have the game between Mark Vilashvili and Gureyev. We looked at this earlier. Yes. Um, and it looked like Marco Sivis had a great position. And here, he found a nice tactical shot. The rook on g7 is under attack. You can't take on f7 yet because of the rook on c7. Oh, but he made geez. this move rook b to g6, which looks very unconventional. You're saying, can I just take your rook? Well, there's a trick here. Rook takes. Uh, knight on g8 with check. The king comes to e7 to protect the rook, and now rook simply back to g7 picks up this rook. So after rook b to g6, the only move is to save this knight is to go eight, knight h6, and after rook g5, this knight has no more moves. My next move is rook h7. It looks like Gareev really is going down sometime soon. Well, he's not smiling anymore. He was smiling before, ready <laughs> to shake hands, but Oh wait, hang on, now he's, now he's not smiling, he's doing the opposite. He's like completely depressed, look at him there. <laughs> yeah, he looks quite upset, and he should be, but he might be sleeping, he might be nap time, so <laughs> maybe we should get him some tea and crackers. Well, it's nap time for him anyway, he's going to lose that. Computers say 95% loss there for him. I love his hair, he's certainly one of the most interesting, wild, random chess players here at the Millionaire Chess Open, isn't he, Lawrence? He is, he's a personality. I love the way he plays chess. It's right up my street. Watch a lot of his games. He's very talented. Today, it's not his day, but I tell you what, if we can just quickly go back to this game of the round for me. Zhong, he's got force mate, and it's such a beautiful checkmate. I thought I have to share it with you. We, I would love to say, keep the shot here on the board. We can see he's looking. He's got about, I believe, 17 minutes. His opponent's only got, is that six seconds? Yeah, it looks like six seconds, Lawrence. Let's see if we can get a zoom in there. Here we go. He's got six seconds left, right? Unbelievable. All he needs to do, if we can keep that shot there, is if he picks up that pawn that he's been using as a threat for the whole game and queens it, that will actually lead to force mate. I can now illustrate that on the board. If he plays c8 equals queen, it's a beautiful idea because what it does, it actually deprives black of a square. So when the rook takes it, now you give another check with this rook. The king has only got one square. You give another check with this rook. Again, the king's only got one square. You keep on forcing this king back with the rooks. And after king a8, you've got rook a7, check, king b8, and rook b6. And that's all she wrote. So can we quickly go back? Has he played that move? Not, not yet. yet. Not okay. yet, Lawrence. He's double checking. He he's looks like he's thinking about it. He's <laughs> going to see it. Look at him eyeing that square. If you had to draw an arrow from his eyes to the chessboard, <laughs> where, which square would that be on? And his arrows will work better than the ones on your screen, Lawrence. So I think he's, he's got well, I think his eyesight his eye. works a lot better than mine. That's, <laughs> that's the problem. Well, one thing that looks for sure is that Zhao sees it. He's, he sees something. He's not happy. He's thinking, <laughs> why me? <laughs> He's got the camera on his shoulder. Why did I go out last watching. night? I should have gone me? to bed at 10 p.m. <laughs> He's going to do it. Look. He's yeah, busting he's, to, he's do to do it. He either needs to go he's to the toilet or he was going to play C8 <laughs> equals queen. Or maybe both at the same time. Maybe both. Know. Go for it. Do it. Come on, Jeffrey. He's about to move. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. Oh, oh no. He's gone. 
Come back to us. So he, he see him eye the camera out of this corner of his eye. He saw us watching him. He knows that we're talking about him. He knows we're everybody cares about Jeffrey Zhang. And he knows that he's going to win. So I like it. He's going to win. He's just kind of milking the moment. Oh. Stealing the line. He's about to move. His uh, right hand is so close to moving. He's got a pen in it. He's got to he's put got the got pen, pen down pen. first. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Maybe he's going to push the pawn with the pen. Maybe he's going to wait until he has six seconds left so they can have a fair fight. I think that's what he's, he might be thinking. Oh, how Maybe he wants the cameras off. Maybe he's feeling the pressure. <laughs> well, I don't know. Should we take the camera off? I don't think so because he, he's about to move, but I appreciate the young man is taking his time. He knows he's got the time. He doesn't want to screw this up right now. Let him calculate. He's got 14 minutes. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't have to go crazy. Yeah, and when I was growing up, my coach always told me to sit on my hands before I yes, made a move. Yes, I was it, told that as well. He's not sitting on his hands, but he's got them firmly interlocked. So he's, he's, he's calm. He's not going to make a move without really thinking about it. And, you know, we're just waiting for him to win. I know we keep you know, talking him up here, but it's a great showing by him. He's looking at that eye. He's, he's eyeing the square, as Lawrence was pointing out before. Yeah, we don't want to miss the moment when he plays C8. Hopefully, he finds it and plays it. I mean, it's are there any other continuations here, Lawrence? No, I mean, there are, there, I'm sure there are, but it is relatively simple, uh, the idea as it goes, because uh, you deprive the king of the square. The king would love to hide in behind. He's reaching. Oh, oh no. Might still be winning what it's, he played it's here. It definitely should still be winning, Lawrence. Yes, but it's it, still It winning. is a bit of a disappointment because we don't get to see the fantastic finish. But he's going to win this game, so. Well, let's have a look at this position because suddenly rook d5, king c8. Hold on a second. Now what? Now what, Mr. Hess? I don't know. It looked like he still has the great position, but at the same time, he's got to be worried about that a2 pawn. Um, oh, I understand everything. He wants to play rook e7. Yep. Rook e7. There we go. He just played it. Checkmate. Rook Beautiful. e7. He's got mate lined up right there. Rook e7. And is he oh, gonna... he's found a way. That's fantastic. Yeah, he, he stopped himself from flagging right there. He's, it looks like two or three seconds left on the clock for black, but here it's all over. All Where did she he wrote. go? He went rook to a6. But now he, oh, look at him. He's got the queen in his hand. He's ready to do this. Let's oh. see, let's see what. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a great little might, finish here. Yeah, he might go rook d. Oh. Knight a7, what a boy. Wow. Well, great, that was a great tactic. Great move. Look at this. What a what a really great tactic that is. Knight a7, rook, and now rook d8, and, and that is that. That's an equally finish. He's going to resign here. He's I think I like resign. that finish better, Lawrence. I think he. Uh, it's cute. He just painted a picture. He's gone. And That's it's it. It's over. It's over. Jeffrey Zhang. Young Jeffrey Zhang. Unbelievable. Second upset. Grandmaster in a row. This guy is going for it. He's going for his Grandmaster norm. He's going for the $100,000 prize. And I think something to point out is this should be a huge confidence boost. Last night's win was not exactly a clean victory. It's something that you probably feel a little upset about because I think it looked like he won in a losing position. Yep. This game was a completely different story. He just dominated his opponent. It was unclear. He just played significantly better chess than his high rate opponent. And he is kind of the tournament hero thus far. He is definitely the guy to watch, and he's definitely the hero of round three here at the Millionaire Chess Open. I wonder, can we get him in here for a little interview? I certainly hope so, because he's 3-0. and You asked me before who else is kind of undefeated. He, Look at him. He's there. Oh, there he's with is his dad. His, is that his dad? Well, I everyone's so. congratulating him. He is definitely the star of this tournament so far. Second GM scalp in a row. Yeah, and he's got the swagger to pull it off. Look at him with his hood. And his skinny jeans there. He, you know, he's ready to fight with anyone. <laughs> he is, and it's going to be interesting who he plays next, because whoever he plays next is definitely going to be a grandmaster, definitely going to be in the top three, top five, you'd say. And you'd better be scared. Yeah, we might see him on you know, either board one or board two next round, so we'll, yeah. we'll be happy to get to his game next round as well. Definitely. Look at him handing in <laughs> proudly his score sheet. That's always the best part, you know, when you win. You, you hand it in and... It's like, well, it's over. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, look at him. He, he looks finally looks calm. He's not, you know, doesn't have to think about it anymore. He can go get some f food and be happy. So. But it's good to see the camaraderie between these players. Look at his opponent, who just lost, and it, you would say an embarrassing loss to a much younger, lower-rated opponent. He's chatting with his dad. That's that's the beauty of chess. You know, it's a gentleman's game, and we're all friends here. Although the fight is, of course, on the board. Yeah, and um, you know we're just happy to see such a young player uh, 
become victorious in the big stage, not afraid of anyone. I mean, I, I hope I was like that when I was younger, but uh, you know, it's been a long time now. So uh, you know, I hope he comes in here and talks to us a bit because it would be interesting to get his thoughts. Well, he is a very serious young man. He can't come into the studio right now, unfortunately, because you know, he, he's wise. He knows what he's doing. He's gotta, he doesn't have much time to prepare for the next game. He's just one. And let him focus on the next game. We'll have him in the studio another time. But best of luck to him. Lawrence, any final thoughts before we finish this show? Yeah, well, I mean, the show belongs to this kid, doesn't it? I mean, he's played unbelievably good chess so far. Today, the way he finished the game was spectacular. And he's on three out of three, one of the very few. In fact, if we look at the, the other games, who else is on 100% so far? Well, from what I can see, it's him and Mr. Matamoros, I think. And the, Lenderman. And Lenderman. So there's three currently on three out of three. Still a few more games in progress. Brunello is pushing. Uh, we have on board number four as well. Uh, no, there was a draw, Shankland. Conrad Holt should be a draw. So really, we're looking at just a handful of players on 100% score. We're going to see Mr. Young. Jeffrey Zhang on one of the top boards in the next round. I can't wait to see the action. Really hope you've had a good time as well. Thank you, Lawrence. Hopefully we can get the young Jeffrey in tonight after the, the fourth round when he's got a bit more time to relax. Hopefully, who knows, maybe another GM scalp there on the way. Robert, any final thoughts? Well, it was another exciting round. And, you know, there's a misconception about the draw. Draws are seen as being boring, but there have been so many exciting draws this round. And I think that the fighting spirit of the players is really shining this tournament. They're all fighting. We're in Vegas where you know, we like to take a little bit of a gamble sometimes. And these players, for some of them paying off, for players like Sidora, it didn't. So I think look, going forward, that the tension is heating up. Players will be really combative, and it's, it's fight. It is. Well, big thank you to Grandmaster Robert Hess. My name is Ariane Kuili. We will see you again tonight for round four of the Millionaire Chess Open at 8 p.m. Pacific time. Be there, we'll be here, and it's gonna be exciting. See you then.